Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting in 2018 of the Rural, Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask everyone please to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received, so we'll move straight on to the agenda item one, which is the implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the EU uh, in relation to agriculture and fisheries. We're going to be taking evidence from two panels. Um, the committee took evidence from stakeholders on this topic last year, and this session actually provides us an opportunity to hear about any updates. I'd like to welcome the first panel. First of all, Martin Kennedy, Vice President of NFU Scotland. Andrew Midgley, Policy Research Manager for Scottish Lands and Estates. Vicky Swales, the Head of Land Use Policy RSPB. Dr. Carmen Hubbard, Senior Lecturer of Agriculture at Newcastle University. And Professor Michael Keating, the Professor of Politics at the University of Aberdeen. Now we have a number of themes and, and members of the committee are going to lead off on each theme. So I'm not going to introduce them. Uh, the themes, I'll just ask the member to introduce them. If you want to speak, just to remind you, if you could try and catch my eye, um, you don't feel you have to answer or uh, come in every time, otherwise we'll never get to the end of the nine themes, to give you a clue of how many we've got to go through um, by the end of it. So if you want to say something, catch my eye and, and I'll bring you in. Could I also just also remind you that if you are speaking, just to keep looking at me occasionally, I might give you a sign to to reduce the length of your answer uh, without reducing the content of it. Um, so it's just a question of managing it. So I, I'd try not to interrupt you. So, and for those that haven't given evidence before, which I think you all have, don't worry about any of the control panel in front of you. That will be done for you and your microphones will be activated when you need to. So the first theme um, is going to be introduced by John Finney. John. Um, um, I want to talk about champions and advisors, and as ever, there's a, a great deal happening. We've got the agricultural champions in their interim discussion document was produced in November of last year. Professor Griggs and his work on the, the Greening Group and a discussion paper produced fairly recently, the National Council for Rural Advisors and their interim report published last year. It, could maybe just give me your general comments on the, on the roles of all of these people and whether indeed their interim reports and discussion documents uh, are a sound and consistent basis for the development of uh, detailed agricultural policy for Scotland. Going ahead, please. Um, Vicky, you were the first one to put your hand up, so everyone else looked at each other to see who was going first. Vicky, you start off. Anyone else just catch my eye? Vicky. Thank you, convener. And I should say I'm also here wearing a Scottish Environment Link hat, the umbrella body for uh, environmental NGOs. Um, I was also a member of the Greening Group, chaired by Professor Russell Griggs. I was very pleased to have that opportunity, and we've come forward with a paper which I think, I hope, sets out um, what we feel are some cogent arguments and ideas about the way forward for policy to deliver environmental outcomes um, in, in Scotland. Um, obviously, we've um, been following the working of the other groups, the agriculture champions and their interim report and responded to that and the National Council of Rural Advisors. Um, I think it's sometimes a little difficult to see how all of those groups are going to join up and where all their conclusions are going to come to in terms of where we go next, but obviously that is something for the future and I think we feel that we do actually need to move quite quickly now to get on the front foot to start to spell out um, the sense of direction for agriculture policy in Scotland going forward. I think there's a lot of commonality across those groups. I think there's a lot of shared conclusions in terms of some of the problems, some of the challenges, and also I think in terms of some of the solutions that we need to put in place in terms of some of the policy mechanisms and payments and measures going forward. So I think it's my, my message is I think let's get on the front foot, let's start to agree what we agree on and start to work out some of the detail. Admittedly, there being lots of uncertainties and issues we don't yet know the conclusions of in terms of trade agreements and all those things. But I do think we can, we can start to spell out what we want to see in terms of the future for agriculture and the environment in Scotland. Andrew, do you want to add to that? Um, I, as I support what Vicky says. Uh, I think we need to see some action. We need to see, um, some, so, so the, we need to see the government grasping hold of the agenda. Um, 
unfortunately, um, with the greatest respect to the groups, because the, the, group, the, the groups are populated by eminent people doing a, a job that they've been asked to do, our, our, our issue is more with the government in, in terms of we want to see the government sort of take hold of and, and move forward on these agendas more quickly, like Vicky says. If we go back through some of the, the sort of the policy development in, say, if you take the agriculture champions area, you've, got, you've had various reports from 2001, 2006, with uh, the forward strategy next steps. There was a vision document in 2010. There was the, the national discussion document that was 2015. And, um, and that then uh, opened a year of discussion about where we should go, go for Scottish agriculture. The Scottish Government then produced a document in 2016 summarising that, and, and that document basically said that the, the sort of findings was that the vision was sound, there should be a focus on priorities, so really focus, instead of trying to achieve everything, focus on, real, on, on what's the real priorities, and the priorities are, are sort of enhancing profitability of Scottish agriculture and enhancing environmental sustainability. But then six months later, the government creates a group to look at the issue again, and, and, and so there's, a, there's an element of frustration in that we want to see progress, um, and at the moment we're kind of still talking and, and there's a feeling that we're kind of behind the curve in the wider develop, de debates about where agriculture is going in the context of Brexit. So action is a key thing. The, the, a, a, uh, in terms of the content, so the Agriculture Champions report, there was one element that we'd like to see, or it's, it's a, a concerning element, which is that agriculture and, and, the, and the, the sort of debates about the future of agriculture tend to be um, taken forward separate from the debates about agricultural holdings. So agricultural holdings, farm tenancy gets, gets forced through a prism of land reform, and yet all the future of agriculture tends to, um, to uh, be, have, it, have its own debate elsewhere. And it seems unfortunate that we're not talking about how do we create the best circumstances for agriculture to, to succeed when we've got a big chunk of the sort of industry being dealt with somewhere else. OK, I'm going to bring Martin in, and then, John, if you want to push back, because Carmen would like to come in as well, so m m maybe you've got a, a follow-up quest follow question that could come in. So, Martin, if you come in on that. Yeah, uh, thank you, convener. I think, kind of, to echo Andrew's points, really, to a certain extent, I think we do need to move on now. With regard to being in the front foot, I think NFU Scotland was. Um, at last year, when we launched our change document, we were av aware of the priorities we need to focus on. We understand that we need to move slightly where agriculture is at the present time. And our three priorities was productivity improvements, um, environmental benefits, and still having that stability payment. Now, we took that lead last year. And with regard to the, the question on how we feel the, the National Council of Rural Advisors and the champions, the Greg's Review Group's reports were, we were actually quite um, uh, happy with with, with the direction they were going in because we thought it kind of backed up our argument to a certain extent. So with regard to their uh, um, uh, reports so far, so we'll say, um, we were quite happy with that and we want to take, but again, to echo what Andrew says, we need to actually move on now because time will catch up on this very, very quickly. But as regards our priorities when we launch the change document, we do recognise we need to look more towards the environment, uh, seek the environmental benefits, which we can provide. Because bearing in mind agriculture, you know, farmers and crofters across the country are looking after um, farming and crofting 73% of the land mass in Scotland. So we, they are, we're absolutely key as um, grassroots members is actually delivering these outcomes, and we feel we can actually do that. John, do you want to come back in there? Or you... I, I just wonder, I, I do sense, Mr. Minister's frustration there, um, the extent to which all of this is completely changed by the uncertainty around Brexit. I mean, is the suggestion there should be a consolidation of these reports or... Because I imagine in different circumstances people might be critical of a government that set a course of direction unsure of um, arrangements with the EU. Can I, can I bring Carmen in on that and then maybe come back to Andrew or, or who else? Carmen, do you want to come in on that? Yes, thank you. Yes, I do believe that a consolidation of the reports will actually make sense. And when I was reading the, uh, the, document, the documents which were provided, particularly the document for the champions, I thought that uh, there is a lot of common sense there and um, there are some very good points that actually the champions uh, the champions uh, made within the report which as an academic uh, I felt that it fits very well with with my own thinking and one of the point it is about the, the um, the change in the mindset of the farmers, the business models, and also the fact that um, 
public support is not an automatic right. And we all need to think that, um, you know, if we have, if we want to make our voice heard, uh, and we want, you know, to be to get public support, how we can actually uh, encourage uh, consumers and taxpayers to support to support us. But I do believe very much into the consolidation of the uh, of the report. Something of which I would like to mention is about the fact that wherever we go, uh, where, where I'm going around, I can hear about self-sufficiency, and I think that uh, from our point of view, I mean uh, the UK level. Um, this will be very difficult to be achieved. And that is because we don't have a comparative advantage uh, when it comes to agriculture. Uh, we are doing, I think, very well, but should, we should actually focus on those things which we think we can uh, be uh, um, uh, competitive and uh, will bring us uh, an, uh, uh, a profit. I'm going to bring Andrew in and then Vicky and then come back to John, if I may. Andrew. Um, yes, Brexit clearly changes a great deal. It presents an entirely new context, but the fundamental issues remain. So we know we have a good handle on what those issues are because they have been recurring themes through all those different policy documents that have looked at the future of agriculture around productivity, enhancing profitability, around the, um, the, the difficulties associated with the nature of the land in Scotland, around, um, the, you know, uh, the environmental improvements that we need to deliver, those sorts of things. So we, know, we, we have a pretty good handle on what we need to do. Um, so yes, Brexit does present a new context, but that doesn't necess necessarily mean that we don't have a clear idea of the sorts of things that we still need to do anyway. Uh, Vicky, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, and I think whilst there are all these uncertainties as a result of Brexit and the ongoing negotiations, I, I think we can say what we want for Scotland and I think we can set out at least the broad structure of the policy that's needed to take us forward. Um, I think we can look to what's also happening in Europe in relation to common agricultural policy and we've had two communications now from the Commission setting out the direction for that, which one way or another, depending upon the outcomes of the Brexit negotiations, may well continue to frame what, what we think we need to do here as well. So we should look to that and that's talking about a much more outcomes-led policy with much more to use the EU jargon subsidiarity for the member states and regions to define the policy that best delivers for the outcomes that we're all looking for, be they on the economic front, the environmental or the social. So I, I think absolutely we should be shaping that. And I, and I would say a bit of a challenge, I think Scotland often leads in many respects, has got some world leading legislation and policy. I kind of sense as, as a UK organisation, my colleagues in, in Wales and Northern Ireland and England, their governments are moving quite quickly to shape what they want to see in terms of future policy. And it does rather feel that Scotland is a little bit behind the curve at this point in time. OK, thank you. That, that, that sort of lit, thank you, John. That, that leads us neatly on to theme two. Um, 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 that's going to be Mike Rumbles. Thank you very much, Convene. It is about the future of agricultural policy, and it, it just follows quite neatly, in fact, just from what Vicky has been saying. Just to let, put this into context, back in January last year, Parliament unanimously passed a motion calling on ministers to establish an independent group involving stakeholders to provide advice to the principles and policies which should underpin options for rural support beyond 2020. Now, the committees heard from the agricultural champions that this is not them, and it seems neither is the National Council of Rural Advisors going to provide these options. So, and, and particularly taking what Vicky just said there, would you agree that it's, what we should be doing is really getting the producers, the environmentalists, the consumers more particularly, getting every stakeholder involved to design and input that to the to, to, to Scottish Government so that we can get a system which everybody can buy into because it will by only buy by buying into it, will we actually get a one, a one that succeeds? A lot of people have been saying that to me, and I was wondering whether you would agree with that. And is, is that the future forward? Have, have we missed a trick over the last 18 months? Um, I'm going to bring in comment. Uh, I think the, there's one group that you said we'd missed out, which was the polit politician side of it. And, and I'd, I'd like to get the professor in at some stage during this debate on it. So come, would you like to go first on that? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, 
some years ago, I have done a lot of work on island. I was looking at the um, um, structural changes of the agriculture and rural development island since the beginning of, uh, of the, the, the Republic and even before. And one thing which came out of the report, it was very clear that um, the relationship and a partnership between the public, private, and the government sector actually made a difference. Of course, we, they had a, a national uh, uh, strategy, a regional strategy. There are other things. And of course, they got a lot of subsidies from the European Union. However, I think that bringing together people at the table um, it does make a difference. And it's not only about the stakeholders, but it's, you know, everybody. And we really need also to get farmers to work uh, within the supply chain. I think it's, that, will be, um, uh, that will be crucial. But everybody should actually be involved. And again, if I'm allowed to say that um, um, when it comes to rural, our voice is um, maybe less heard. And probably... Um, um, Rural doesn't really foc doesn't really appear, you know, when um, in in documents and uh, uh, around Westminster. It is true that we talk about agriculture, but w agriculture, which is at the cent it is the center of the rural community, and everything comes comes around. So I think that's that's crucial. Okay, uh, Andrew, and then Vicky. Um, so the question was. Should, should there be the process to uh, involving everyone? I'd say, yes, there needs to be a process, but I think the government needs to galvanise the process. We could create a process that just grows arms and legs, but we, we need speed, and so the government needs to take the lead. Vicky, do you want to build on that? Well, I fully support that, um, and the point I was going to make, I think, I think genuinely, yes, a broad range of stakeholders round the table, farming, rural, environmental... Uh, and consumers. So I think one, one trick we often miss is connecting the farming policy with our food system and our food policy. We, we have a commitment to a good food nation bill. We need an agriculture policy and a food po a policy now that delivers in the broader sense for society uh, in terms of our, our food production. So I think I'd like to see that joining up happen as part of that process. Um, Michael, do you want to add something at this stage? Because I'd like to go back to Mike, because I think there are other questions, and which will then allow me to bring in Martin. So, yeah, 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 I'd start up with a general comment about policymaking in Scotland after the evolution, which is that we've not really been very good at social partnership or joining up previously separate policy areas. This is the, of course, will of the wisp of public policymaking, how you can join things up. Uh, we, we, we're very good in Scotland about consultation, but that's quite a different matter altogether. And particularly in changing policy fields, because we used to have agricultural policy and then it's rural policy, and rural policy has an economic dimension, environmental dimension, a social dimension, even a, a cultural dimension. We haven't really quite caught up with this. Uh, and we're not very good at managing change in Scotland either. We, we have a consensual model of policy making, which in some respects is, is very good, but doesn't really enable us to face up to the challenge of change. And agricultural policy and rural policy is going to change, irrespective of Brexit. We all know it's changing. The old model is changing. Brexit may give us that shock and force people to do it, but it's not happening fast enough because the Brexit is, is forcing the timetable. So I'd entirely concur with what my, my fellow witnesses have, have said here. Uh, we haven't really got up to, to speed with this, facing uh, decisions that have got to be taken in the very near future, which may have long-term consequences. I'm going to bring Mike back in, and I'll I will come to you, Martin. Don't worry, I'm not forgetting you. I'm, I'm very much seeing you you're wanting to come in. But putting this into context, of course, for many years... The £500 million pounds or so that's gone into our rural economy every year um, hasn't really been challenged amongst ministers because if we haven't used it for the European programmes, we wouldn't be able to use it at all. But when we leave the European Union, this money could be up for grabs. And, and all this whole process of support to, our ru to rural Scotland could be questioned unless, uh, in my view, and I was wondering if you'd comment on this, unless the government come forward having discussed this with all the stakeholders, with a bespoke system that is suitable for Scotland, which is perfectly defensible uh, from not just from all the aspects of from producers, consumers and everybody else. So that I mean by defensible, defensible amongst other competing 
arguments from the health service or the education service, which it has not been exposed to to now. And this is going to be a major issue, I think, when we leave the European Union. And I'd just like to hear your views about that, about the view that I'm expressing. Uh, I'm going to go to Martin and then Vicky. Uh, thanks, Convener. I think what you've said, Mike, is absolutely spot on about having a bespoke system for Scotland. That's absolutely vital because we are, you know, we are different from the rest of the, the UK and we need to have that going forward. To comment what um, Carmen said about having the rural voice heard, that's probably been missed quite, quite a lot to a certain degree. I think the, we've been in a number of meetings. I, for one, was in one last year where there was 27 people around the table talking about the future of agricultural policy and support. I was actually the only farmer that was there. But I was the one that was going to be facing the consequences of the decisions that was going to be made. So to hear the rural voice and what's actually going to fit on the ground. We've talked about supply chains there already. The supply chain system is not working from a, from a grassroots farmer and crofter's perspective. So we need to have a system. There is 500 million coming into Scotland that, as you say, is up for grabs. We need to make sure that that's actually ring-fenced agriculture, because although those 500 million comes in, agriculture is spending 2.8 billion back out into the economy, and that's actually the catalyst for the food and drink sector in Scotland, and that's the bar largest part of the economy. So we need to make sure we do listen to the rural voice and who that this is actually going to affect most, and that's actually the farmers and crofters that are on the ground. Andrew, I'm going to bring you in, and then I'm going to briefly bring Jamie in uh, before I go back to Mike for a further question. Andrew, first. Yeah. Um, thank you, convener. The, so, the, yes. Sorry, I've got that completely wrong. Andrew, I'm going to put you on pause. And Vicky, you're right to catch my attention because you asked first. It's Vicky first, and then I'm going to bring Jamie in, and then Andrew. You'll all get your chance. We will, we will. I'm sorry, I don't want to cause a disruption in, in the panel. So, Vicky, you were first, and, and I'll bring you in now. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I think Andrew and I are actually on, a, on the same page on a lot of things. But anyway, um, so last March, Scottish Environment Link produced our paper Renewing Scotland's Rural Areas, and we set out some ideas about future policy, and we said some things that I think are very pertinent to this question. Um, we're absolutely clear that we need to retain at least the current levels of investment that we currently get from the cap in our rural areas, in agriculture, in delivering environmental outcomes. But I think you're absolutely right. We are going to have to fight hard and make some very cogent, convincing arguments to the taxpayer and the people who are stumping up this money as to why we should spend that money and what outcomes it's delivering. Um, Link thinks that we, we should keep that money, but we should reshape and reframe how we spend it. We think one of the strongest arguments is that we use that money, public money, to deliver public goods, that we should underpin agricultural land management and deliver the environmental and other outcomes that we're looking for. We should use that money to make investments to facilitate change, to help farming businesses adapt and become better able and better placed to benefit from the market and to, to explore uh, opportunities out there. And we need to invest in supporting activities, in training, advice, education, research that underpins all of this. So three broad areas. And by doing that, we think we can reshape um, how, the outcomes that we're getting and get more bang for our buck from, from that money which taxpayers are, are stumping up. And that's where we need to get to and get to quite quickly. OK, Jamie, do you want to come in briefly there? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, given that we've relied uh, on membership of the CAP and given that farming is a, a, a quite a, a heavily subsidised industry in the UK, as it is across much of Europe, um, and whilst there might be some political to and fro around funding commitments as we move forward post-Brexit, does anyone on the panel have any view on whether they think the Scottish Government at the moment uh, has a solid uh, plan for creating uh, the sort of bespoke system that Mr Rumbles was talking about. Uh, and I'm not saying this to make any political points, because I think it's important as a committee what we're here to do is see what the industry thinks. Um, uh, if we are prepared, notwithstanding the financial settlement that may or may not occur between the various governments, uh, but from a policy point of view, in developing the future of Scottish farming, are we in a good place at the moment? Andrew, do you want to answer that? And then I'm going to come back to Mike Rumbles. I know Richard's wanting to say something as well. So, Andrew, first of all. Um, is, is there a plan? Not that I'm aware of. Um, are we in a good place? Not really. Uh, so I think we've got 
quite a long way to go to get into that better place. That's why um, we need the speed to, and, and the sort of development of that position quickly. The, the, um, I, we entirely support, on the point of the, you know, cr creating a defensible uh, system, we entirely um, support and have, have stated that we are um, sort of keen to see a move, a change in the support, so that it is much more defensible, and, there, and that means probably moving towards a, a greater emphasis on the delivery of public goods, so that if you're using public money, people can see what they are getting in return, and, and we accept that. And, and I would pick up a, on Martin's point on, being, on a bespoke system. Absolutely, that's really important, and, and one reason why it's really important is because of um, the, the nature of the land use in Scotland being slightly different to England and Wales. What I have in mind is actually forestry, so we're talking about agriculture policy, but actually um, rural land use is going to change, and forestry has a role in that rural land use and is supported through the same sort of funding streams. And so we have to think carefully around um, how, we, how we might want to use the land and um, how different sort of policy areas fit together. So yes, we want to support agriculture, uh, but also we want to support forestry and we need to be sort of intelligent about that. So we need to create something in Scotland that's bespoke for us that enables these things to work together. Do you want to follow up, and then, last, then I'll come to you to come and I'll come point, to you. I want to be fair here because I want to put the counter argument that I've just been putting. Uh, when we had the cabinet secretary here before, and I've asked him that very same question because I feel oh, that's, this is the way we should be going. Um, he said, "Well, I can't do that because we don't know what the level of funding is going to be. Um, how can I design the system if I don't know what the level of funding is going to be?" Uh, and so far, that has been the cabinet secretary's response to this line of questioning. And I wondered what your reaction is to that response. In other words, uh, I can't do that. I can't set the bespoke system until I know how much money we're getting. What's your view on that? Carmen, would you like to say something on that? And Martin, I, yes, I noticed and you immediately raised yeah, your hand. I'm just on. trying to think of all the questions, because I would have started with the question about, you know, uh, uh, not being about politics. Politics always prevails. And I would ask everybody, and I think I would say the same in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in, you know, the Westminster. I think we really have to come together. Whatever party, whatever, we really need to have a voice if we really want to make Brexit a success for everybody. I am a Remainer. I'm a Romanian because I'm a Romanian as well. So, and, but I'm here for about 18, month, 18 years. So I think we should really start working together. Uh, you're right, probably we don't have a plan, uh, but there is no plan at Westminster for the moment. We, we have, except what, Mr., uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Gov said us in the speech at, at Oxford. The other question will be related, public money for public goods, but what are public goods? It's not yet a definition, and we don't have any idea how that will actually, um, how this will work in practice, and how implementation will actually, uh, would, would means could we may end up with um, more, more red tape that maybe we have probably now, depending on what how we would like, you know, to assess what's actually happening on the ground. But I would like to come to your last, to your question. Um, uh, when it comes to funding, I think we have to think about uh, why do we give this funding, what's the purpose, whom will be the beneficiary, and how they will, you know, how they will be, how will they will benefit actually from from this money, and I, I strongly believe that subsidies so far under the cap have been misused. And we all know that larger farmers benefited, and I have a lot, I have figures on the capitalization of land um, following the decoupled payments. And even the reform which was done after 2013, a new paper which actually came out just a few months ago, which showed that actually 15 per, uh, more than half of the, the farming support actually it goes into 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 the, the value of the land so it it, uh, it it it's quite important and what so funding should i think should be targeted to those who are actually in need and are vulnerable and probably we need to identify who are they and why they need it and how they how they will benefit from and um the other point i want to make is that um, we have to think about that 
based on Ricardo theory, any form of, of support which uh, is related to uh, land use, which will, actually, which will always capitalize in the, land, in the value of the land. So whatever subsidies we give, which are related to land use, to a lesser or greater extent, somehow will be capitalized on the, the, land, on the value of the land. So I let you think about the ownership. Okay, um, I'm going to bring Martin in, and then I'm going to bring Richard in very briefly. Ma Martin, yeah, you want no, to come in? On the first point, um, do we think that the Scottish Government have a plan uh, to echo what uh, Andrew said? No, I don't think they do. Uh, on the second point, should we wait, or should we wait until we find out what the budget is? Um, I honestly don't think that's uh, the way forward, because if we wait till we've got clarity on what the budget is going to be, it's going to be too late. I think if we're smart enough, and I think we can do it, is we devise a system that will be relevant to whatever budget is going to be achievable in the future. And I think that's absolutely vital, because we have to get it to, again, say what Carmen said, it needs to be targeted at the correct pe people. In December, when we spoke to George Eustace, he recognised the, the, the area-based system as not being maybe the best way forward and possibly been a, a mistake in the past. Um, and I think going forward, we'll have a great opportunity now to target those who actually are in need of this support mechanism and highlight what we are getting from that support, whether it's environmental benefits, whether it's productivity improvements, whether it's going to be supporting agriculture in rural areas that's keeping people in these areas, because people are very, very important in this whole outcome. We need to keep people in our rural, in, in our rural areas for environmental benefits and for tourism benefits as well. And I think we have an opportunity now that we can actually grasp. We might not get another chance for a long time, but the system's not worked so far, um, and it needs to be targeted far better that those that are providing environmental benefits and doing what we can do for the economy in Scotland. OK, I'm going to briefly bring in Richard. Yeah, I'm uh, very surprised at what Martin Kennedy just said there, but uh, maybe refreshing, but come on to the point that Vicky Swales was saying. So you may say there's now an opportunity to fully review the payment system, but when you change a system, you effectively do someone out of money. And we're going to have a lot of farmers who are not going to be happy campers if we effectively take someone's getting £100,000 and tomorrow they're only getting fifty. So, you know, hear what you're saying, Martin, but, well, to, my, to me well, it sounds so, as though you were. Sorry. But to get, you know, the point of Vicky Swales, do you agree that we have to review, refresh the system? And if we do, are we not going to have a lot of people who are going to be unhappy? Um, Vicky, you can answer that, and then I'm going to come... Uh, I've got a particular question for, for Michael, if I may. So, Vicky, if you'd like to answer that. Well, inevitably, there will be change, and it's often talked about in, in relation to CAP. You know, if, when you change things, there are winners and there are losers. I'm not sure that's always the right way to look at it. Back to the point, this is taxpayers' money. What is it delivering? Um, I think critical to this will be about transition, and we may come on to this. I mean, none of us, I think, are arguing that we go from the, one system... The very next theme to, is transition, to another so system please don't dwell on to it. ...overnight, that, that people have to have time to adapt, but they need clarity of what the end point is, and I think if they know where we're going and what the new system is going to look like, people can adapt their businesses and look at what the new opportunities might be. But there will be change. There will be restructuring within the agriculture sector and the land use sectors. I think that is an inevitable consequence of, of what we are facing. OK, thank you. I, I would like to ask uh, Michael a question, but before I do, I'm going to have to admit, as a convener, I was remiss at the beginning of the meeting not to ask members to declare any interests they have. And it should go on record uh, that there are members with interests, and I'm going to do the first declaration in the... It, in my register of interests, I am a member of a farming partnership. And I suspect there may be other members might like to declare an interest at this stage. Uh, Peter, you've caught my eye. I was going to declare an interest convener as a partner in a farming business in uh, Aberdeenshire. Absolutely. Okay. And Stuart, you were going to caught my eye. Uh, I have a very small agricultural holding from which I derive neither support nor income. And I'm glad we got those out of the way before any of the three people on the uh, members of the committee asked a question. 
um, which means that I can now ask a question, Michael, is that the two, two old sayings that I heard, uh, I, I've heard in, in the past is, too much analysis leads to paralysis, and don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution. That seems to be what, what I've been hearing this morning, and, and kind of what you said, is, uh, is that your principle on, on the, this section that we've been hearing? Yes, and, and nobody would disagree with that. The difficulty is how you do it. Uh, and as I said, I've been critical of the way that policymaking has developed in Scotland since the devolution because of the uh, lack of innovation. Uh, we, we, we carry out policies quite well. We consult, we keep people happy, but there's not a lot of uh, innovation and new thinking there. Uh, and uh, this is even more true in agriculture than in other areas. And I think somebody said, was it Mike Rumbles, that we've had all this money coming from the CAP, so this was an excuse not to, not to innovate, not to think about change. So suddenly we've got to do things very, very quickly. Governments are overstretched. The UK government is massively overstretched by Brexit. It's unable really to think about other policies. The Scottish government is extremely overstretched as, as, as well. So that new thinking has got to come from somewhere else. There are plenty of ideas uh, around there, but we need to do it very, very quickly. And of course, politics is inevitable. It's naive to say, like, take the politics out of it, because politics is all about making public policies. That's what politics is about, and it's about winners and losers, and it's about making tough decisions. So at some point, government is going to have to make some uh, strategic decisions. I, I should say, we shouldn't underestimate the difficulties that the government has got because we don't know how much money there will be, we don't know what strings will be attached, we don't know what free trade deals that will be negotiated. All of this will affect agricultural policy, but at least Scotland has an opportunity here to declare what it wants uh, and in the various negotiations that will take place around, for example, the forthcoming agriculture bill, it will be important that Scotland has a clear position to go into those negotiations and discussions. Okay, I think we'll move on to uh, theme three, which is Peter. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. My theme is about the transition to a future uh, agricultural policy. Now, the UK government has set out some, some meat on the bone, some timing for the transition to a new UK agricultural policy for farm support in England. And I stress that it is in England because Michael Gove has been very clear to me anyway that Scotland is, has the responsibility to, to design the system for Scotland going forward. So uh, the, 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 the timetable in England is 2018 BPS is normal, 2018, 2019 BPS is normal, and then you're into a transition period. Uh, current cash funds are guaranteed until 2022. And going forward, in England, they're proposing a cap or a sliding scale of reductions on, on, on payments. And then post-2024, we're into a new environment of land management system and, you know, being paid public money for public goods. Now, that's roughly where we're, we are, as far as I understand it, with what Michael Gove has said is going to happen in England. What is the panel clear the direction for business in Scotland being provided about what do we expect during a transition period and beyond. Uh, Martin, would you like to leave off on that? Yeah, uh, with regard to transition going forward, I think it also still comes back to um, stability going forward, because post-2024, um, we don't know what budgets are going to be, but it, it, we still need to highlight why Scotland is totally different from England. I know Michael Gove's um, speeches up to the Oxford Farming Conference and again in a few conference um, yesterday is highlighting particularly to do with England. Now Scotland does have to have this bespoke system going forward so with regard transition we would realistically need time until we can have that future arrangements going into place so to our mind we would be looking at something similar until we can actually put in place something post Brexit, post 2024 in fact. But beyond 2019 I see um, the best position we could be in is having a similar scenario until we are um, post, till we get to post 2022. But we need we've, we need this time. We actually need this time to devise a system that will suit Scotland. Time will, uh, will catch up, and it's very. We, we, we've known in the past during previous cap reforms how it's come down to the eleventh hour, and that's very very dangerous because sometimes it doesn't actually deliver what we're trying to achieve. Um, Vicky, do you want to come in on that? I mean, I've already said I think transition is important. I'd concur there with what Martin's just said. Um, 
we very quickly need to decide where it is we're trying to get to, and then we have this period of time where, to me, it makes sense that as far as possible, and with the money that has been committed and appears to be on the table to 2022, that we, we use that time to be thinking about the next, um, the next policy, what it looks like, designing it, and actually even maybe taking some opportunity to trial and pilot some things, and there may be some new approaches, some new ways of doing things. And there's lots of talk about results-based uh, environmental schemes um, compared to the more prescriptive schemes that we have. We think probably a mix of those two things might be sensible. But, but let's be thinking about what we want and let's use this time, which is actually really quite short, um, to, to, to try and do that. Um, and also, obviously, the, just the, the IT and the administration of new systems takes a lot of time to set up, and we do know that from, from, from past systems. So um, it may sound, you know, saying we've got four years or whatever might sound like a lot of time, but it's not at all. And that's why we need that clarity right now about where it is we're trying to get to so we can start to work out the detail of how we get there. I'm going to bring Stuart in and then come to you, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to pick up a little thing in what Martin uh, Kennedy said. Um, I've only read press reports, not the original speech, uh, but I understand Michael Gove referred to LFA in Wales and in Scotland being a fundamentally different aspect of agriculture. Um, would you agree with me that's mildly encouraging? Because I think I haven't heard Michael Gove previously make any specific reference to LFA, which underpins the essentially geographic differences and the need for a different support regime, and that, that might be an early indication that the UK government has that as part of their thinking. Martin, I'll let you answer that, then I'm going to Andrew. Yes, um, um, it is encouraging to hear that, uh, because, uh, as I'm sure we're all aware, we're 85% less favoured areas in Scotland. You know, down across the border, it's only 17%. That's why the bespoke system is absolutely vital. And it's encouraging to hear that he does recognise, because that's the largest part of Scotland, it does need support to keep, again, coming back to people. People are really, really important in Scotland and rural areas. So, it's, yes, to a degree, it's encouraging to hear. OK, Andrew, if you'd like to... Um, I think the answer to the question is actually we don't know in terms of you know plans for transition. And um, the, but like the other um, panel members, we are uh, supportive. We recognise that if we are going to change, and we think there does need to be change, we can't do it in one step. So we need that that process. But and it, therefore we need to set out where we're going. But the, the point I wanted to make was was actually links back to the degree of change that we could experience. Now. Um, it's really hard to know, but there is a potential prospect for quite significant structural change in the industry. And that, when it, that's a kind of a, a, a misnomer. Actually, that means people going out of business, people losing their jobs and moving away, that sort of thing. And, and, and there's a really strong human element to what we're talking about here, which I think probably has to be built into any thinking about transition, to accept that there is going to be a lot of change and find a way of trying to mitigate some of that potential harm. Peter, do you want to follow up? Yeah, well, I mean, it's vitally important that we never lose sight of what farmers are about. Farmers are about producing high quality food to feed the nation. Let's get that right. But we're, 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 moving, we're moving away from, from supporting them directly like that. We're moving away to, you know, Public money for public goods, that's the, the, the phrase that comes out nowadays. Um, but I'm just asking qu the question, did, given that that's the, the, the way that we're moving, um, does the panel endorse what I'm saying, that we have to recognise, first and foremost, it's about producing food, and, and we can do the environmental bit around that, and it's not mutually exclusive in any way or, or shape or form? Uh, I'll bring Martin in. Vicky and Carmen, did you want to come in? Martin first, anyway. Yeah, without doubt, what farmers and, and, and crofters right across the country are all about is, is about food production. And that's probably part of the thing that we sometimes don't, we take it for granted. You know, 50, 60 years ago, we we're spending around 40% of our income on food. Now it's about 8.5%, 9%. So that shows you the value. But we need to remember what we're actually producing to such a high quality and a high degree. It's maybe not a public good, but it's probably a public right to have good quality food grown and uh, reared to high welfare standards. So that is a benefit to the consumer, ultimately. But we need to, yes, definitely recognise that, that food production is still at the core of agriculture in Scotland. 
Vicky may give us an alternative view on the fact that the RSPB aren't all about food production, but... Uh... Well, well, I'd actually like to just read, if I may, something that was in the Griggs report, which we all agreed on, and it says, agriculture should be seen and treated as different from other industries. It is a multi-output, multi-benefit business with non-market outputs, wildlife, landscapes, clean water, etc., as important to society as its traditional market products of food and fibre. These outputs are referred to as public goods and services. Future policies should start from this premise and be designed to support, encourage and sustain the delivery of these non-market outputs, as well as equipping farmers to benefit more from market opportunities, and I would add, and the food that they produce. So it isn't either or. Actually, farming is a multi-output business, and all these things matter to all of us. Food, as much as clean water, a stable climate, and all these other things. They're all part and parcel, and they're intrinsically linked. Carmen, do you want to come in on that? Uh, probably you would not like my answer, uh, because this is an uh, economist answer. Um, there are, uh, we should not think about farming always through the lens of public support. I, and we know there are countries who actually can produce very good quality food and uh, very healthy food without subsidies. I said you would not like my answer because it is an economist answer and you will ask, you know, why would you give subsidies for and why should we actually pay for it? I do think that if we give subsidies, they have to be targeted to those who are really in need. Otherwise, I do not think why we should not allow farmers to be, uh, to, uh, like, the, to be like any other business where they, they compete and they, are, they produce uh, uh, goods and services based on, what the, based on the market opportunity and actually what we, what we want. Carmen, can I just ask a, a question on that? I mean, some would argue, um, and I've heard it argued, that, that subsidies to farmers keeps the price of food down. Is, is that something that you subscribe to or don't subscribe to? Subsidies keeping the food price down yes. depends on the type of the subsidies, because initially, the under the cap, uh, keeping subsidies. No, it it actually uh, subsidies, subsidies means a transfer from consumer or taxpayers to producers. That's what it is a subsidy. It's even a transfer from a consumer or a taxpayer or from both. So within the within, I would say that. Um, it, uh, our food is cheaper now because we are in a market of over 500 million, million people. That's why I think it, we, our food is cheaper within, within the EU. But actually, subsidies do not necessarily keep the prices down. OK. Um, Martin, you sort of indicated it. And then, Michael, if you want to come in, I'm happy to bring you in. Mike, uh, yeah. Martin. First. Yeah, just, just briefly on the supply chain. I think if the supply chain worked correctly and we were receiving the, the amount of money that, for the effort that's gone into providing high quality food, there would be less reliance on support. And that's where we would all like to be. But at the present time, when the average income of a farmer in Scotland is £12,000, it's actually extremely difficult to do any of these jobs without support. And other countries do have the advantage they don't have the, such a high cost structure as what we do. Our cost structure relevant to what we're getting for what we produce. Um, we're kind of sandwiched in the middle. Um, and that's the relevance of us spending so little of our income now on food. M Michael, I'm happy to bring you in if there's something... I mean, the next theme may, may be more uh, focused on you. OK, but, I'll pass on this one. OK, so uh, I would like to move on to the next theme, which is Fulton McGregor. Thanks, and uh, good morning, panel. Um, the next theme's on frameworks, and, and given the uh, GMC meeting in October last year, do you think that there should be a common UK framework for agriculture and what scope and forum should this take? And as the convener said, uh, Professor Keating, I think our briefing papers have actually got a quote from yourself. Um, so perhaps start with yourself. Uh, Michael, would you like to go on that? Yeah, it's, it's generally agreed now that there should be frameworks. When I came to another committee here that I was advising a year ago, there wasn't that agreement, but now there is for two areas. One is about regulation, because a lot of regulation of agriculture is devolved, but it's Europeanized. And there's broad support for the idea that there should be 
uh, the same regulations across the UK. Now, a lot of stakeholders think the European regulations would be the best ones to adopt for that purpose because then we would have uh, access to European markets. Uh, if we sign free trade agreements, including agriculture, with third countries, then that creates difficulties for attaining those European frameworks. So that's a, a big issue there. Uh, and the second is about funding, uh, uh, how much funding there should be, how it should be distributed, and what strings should be attached to funding, whether it should go into the block grant or whether it should be a separate agricultural fund. If there's a separate agricultural fund that already is ring-fencing that money, would there be further uh, ring-fencing of that money? The difficulty is how those frameworks are going to be achieved. And the withdrawal bill, which is still before Parliament and, and may yet be amended, in its famous Clause 11 says the answer to that is essentially to take all these competences back to Westminster, to re-reserve them, which gives Westminster the last say. Now, that's highly problematic for a number of reasons. What, can, one is can, that it's, can, can I uh, understand where you're going on the withdrawal bill, but we're going to deal with that specifically. Okay. Well, so just, if, if you, you, if you could could frameworks, then I'll, I'll just conclude on the frameworks issue then. Uh, the question is frameworks is, is how constraining they would be and secondly, how would they be negotiated, imposed from Westminster or negotiated amongst the four nations of the UK? Thank you. Uh, Vicky, you're next, followed by Andrew. Thank you. Um, we think there will be a need for some kind of commonly agreed UK framework. Um, Michael's outlined some of the areas in on which that might touch in relation to trade and regulations and standards. But I think there are some environmental arguments for why um, that might be needed as well. If we think about very, very many of our environmental challenges which arise from agriculture and the way we use land, those are transboundary. Um, so um, it's, I think, important for us to, to think about how agriculture across the UK and in all parts of the UK um, operates to high standards in order to address uh, climate change issues, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, to protect our water resources, which are often shared and go across our jurisdictional boundaries, um, to halt the loss of biodiversity, which all parts of the UK are signed up to and, and have committed to, to doing, to maintaining healthy soils, etc., and to, to meet our international obligations beyond those European Union ones. So we can see some argument for why there may we may want to see some kind of commonly agreed sort of high-level principles and objectives around environmental ambition in, in, a, in a commonly agreed framework that relates to agriculture. Okay, Stu, you have a particular question on the environment side of that. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Vicky just mentioned uh, greenhouse gases, and that's, of course, an important issue. And I just wondered if the fact that the appointments to the Climate Change Committee have to be agreed by all four jurisdictions, in other words, anyone can veto an appointment, is a model that might uh, be useful in uh, politically being able to draw up uh, policy frameworks uh, as an alternative to perhaps other ways of doing things. It may not be the only way of doing it, but it would be a perfectly practical way if she agrees with me. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I don't think we have, a, a, as environmental NGOs, a necessarily fixed view. We think there are different models and different ways, potentially, of doing this. Uh, that may be one that you've just cited. There are others, for example, the marine policy statement and the way in which the four parts of the UK come together to agree the broad-level objectives for the marine environment, and then it's enacted by devolved policy and legislation. So there are definitely different models and ways in which this, this could be done from sort of very legislative fixed basis on the one hand to memorandums of understanding to commitments in legislation to set up bodies or institutions that fulfil certain functions. So we don't necessarily have a fixed view of what the right way of doing that is, but we would like to see progress in thinking about that and coming up with an answer to it so that we can have this sort of constructive joint working a, a, across our jurisdictions. Favouring a collaborative model. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, Andrew, I'm going to come to you and then Martin and then back to Fulton if you've got a follow-up question. Andrew. 
Thank you, Convener. We came out uh, fairly early on to, uh, in support of developing common frameworks, and we did so because we were concerned that we could potentially go down a route where we had uh, such a degree of policy divergence that, um, that it could have consequences for the market within the UK and potentially consequences for uh, developing trade deals and potentially consequences for the funding settlement, so how the sort of the budget for agriculture is delivered to Scotland. And, and the concern there is around whether it came through the block grant or th through separate agriculture funding. <coughs> now, um, the, I'm we're very aware that that does create the problems, the sort of devolution problems, but what we have in mind when we talk about frameworks is not um, some sort of impo system. We, want, we definitely do want something that is developed together. What we do, also, what we don't have in mind is a system which is imposed uh, from Westminster. It, it has to be something that is um, sort of very much a collaborative process. And um, the, the sort of the issue is around um, how that happens and, and, and what that framework looks like. And from our point of view, it's setting out the broad objectives setting out the principles, but then allowing Scotland the ability at least as much, but potentially more than it has now under the current framework that we operate within. So we have never envisaged it to be sort of a rowing back from where we are. We always envisaged us to maintain at least what we have, but potentially more. And, um, and, and that, so that's a, a key thing, is, is the framework has to be sort of a high level setting out of of a sort of direction of travel, uh, potentially in there, and this is the critical issue that is yet to be resolved, is, is funding. So the, the support structures that we work within, at the moment, a lot of that is sort of determined within the European Union and we implement. There's a question about how far we have to go down that route within the UK. The Scottish Government will say that um, actually we have lots of divergence already, so you know, potentially we can just do our own thing. The, the, the unresolved question for us is, well, how much divergence can you have? before it becomes a problem, and we're unclear on that. So our, our common sense approach was, well, let's go for a framework, but keep it broadly similar to what we have now so that we can still do as much as we, can, as much as we want and still have some policy divergence within the UK because it's within that envelope of a common framework. Martin. Um, I think Andrew's kind of covered most of what I was going to say, but I think we're of a similar opinion, an overarching UK-wide framework would be important when it comes to, particularly when it comes to trade back and forward. I think it's really important because we've got welfare standards, um, pe uh, pesticides regulation, all these things that would have an effect on trade. I think it's important we do have that UK framework. But again, within that, to say what, uh, again echo what Andrew said, within that we need to have that bespoke situation. And with regard to the funding at the current time, we, we receive about 16.3% of the, the the total ag. Um, uh, support system that comes into the UK, and we would certainly be, you know, hoping that we can maintain that at least with the convergence argument backing that up, of course. Um, but uh, going forward, we need to be able to to have a bespoke system within an overarching framework. That overarching framework needs to be as vital for trade because it's it's UK that's going to be trading. Although we have our own um, uh, trade within Scotland, we need to have a UK trade so we can deal with other countries. Okay, uh, Fulton, I, come on, I know you want to come in. I'd like to bring Fulton in just with a follow-up question and then probably come to you. Yeah, thanks uh, again, Convener. Um, based on what you've said there, I think um, uh, it seems that it's safe to assume that, that, you, that you would wish stakeholders and, and the devolved the nations and others um, to be involved in the development of the, the framework. How, how do you think this could best be achieved to make sure that all relevant voices are heard? Carmen, do you want to lead on that? I'm, I'm not sure if I have a, a, a you know, an exact answer, but I, I assume um, a common framework is necessary because some will argue it is about a level playing field for everybody. Uh, however, I think that um, uh, it is very important that the uh, all devolved administration actually come together and try to work at, uh, with Westminster. I think it's very because I feel my my but it's just you know uh, uh, what I what I think. I think um, the power it still lies with Westminster, 
And I think it's not only about Scotland, I think it's also about the Northern Ireland, and I also think it is about Wales. So I think the Devolve administration really need to work together so to counter out, uh, counter out uh, if you like, the power in Westminster. I hope I don't sound, you know, I'm against, I'm against England. In England. <laughs> I live in England, but I do think that it has to be a level playing field for everybody, but uh, you have to fight. I'm going to bring Andrew in, um, and then I think we may move on to the next theme. Andrew. Um, so, yes, we want to be involved in the development of, of a framework, and, and in like most policy development like this, we'll be seeking to try and engage in that debate. But I think this draws us back to a previous sort of element of discussion, which is around the role of the Scottish Government. And when we're talking about the Scottish Government being behind the curve, this is why it's so important, because at the moment, that discussion going on down in Westminster is being led by DEFRA. And we need the Scottish Government to be at the table with the Voice for Scotland um, as strongly as possible. And they can listen to us, we can try and influence them. But that's where the debate is happening at the moment. And we can try and influence through different routes. We work with our, our sister organi organisation in England and Wales. And so we, um, we, we sort of try to sort of in engage in that process. But at the moment, when we're talking about frameworks, it's going to come down to the governments. And we need the Scottish Government to be at that table. Vicky, I know you want to come in. You can come in very briefly. I, I, just say, we, we, we do think there will need to be some new kind of intergovernmental machinery put in place to, to do this stuff, and that the current arrangements we have under the, uh, the Joint Ministerial Committee are clearly n not functioning as we might hope that they might. Um, there have been a, a number of reports which have criticised that and said, you know, they're not operating properly, there's ad hoc meetings, it's not participatory properly of the, the four uh, uh, parts of the UK. So, so having a, a new intergovernmental machinery on a statutory basis and being very clear about how that, how that operates is probably going to be something that's needed as we go forward to, to make sure that these frameworks and other things work properly. OK. Um Thank you. Um, I think we'll move on to the next theme, which is Richard Lyle and Michael. I think you'll be first up on this one. Yeah, I think basically this is where we come to the nub of the argument. European Union withdrawal bill. You know, and the point that's just been made by, uh, by Vicky Swales and, and a comment made by my, one of my, my colleague, John uh, Finney, it takes two to tangle. And basically we've got a situation where the UK government has not accepted any amendments prior to the bill going to the the Lords from the Scottish or Welsh governments. Um, now they're saying that it'll be fixed when it goes to the Lords. We've now got a situation, and I'll come back to you with the greatest respect to Martin. I may have misunderstood him earlier, but basically we've got a situation where um, we're coming out of the EU, we're coming out of the Common Agricultural Policy, we're going back 40 years, basically pre-1970. I can remember those years. Um, in your opinion, in the long or short term, Martin, I, I come to you first, I think, and then the other um, um, panel members, what are the implications of the EU withdrawal bill as it stands for Scottish agriculture? Uh, what systems should be put in place? You know, and with the greatest respect, if we don't know what money we're going to get, we don't know what amendments are going to be, we can't talk to you. Uh, the UK government, or they won't talk to us. We can't put in amendments. You know, where are we? We basically don't know. And the point I want to ask you is, what should be put in place for farmers? How can this government help Scottish farmers have a good system to ensure that there's not anarchy after we come out of the EU? Um, Martin, before you answer, I, I, I would actually like to stick with the way I was going to do it and come to Michael first and then come to you, Martin. So, Michael, if you'd like to, to uh, kick off on this, because you were actually talking about withdrawal bill in the, in the last bit, and I, and I curtailed, curtailed yeah, you. Sorry. Yeah, there were two, two concerns with the withdrawal bill. One is about an issue of constitutional principle, whether it is right for the UK Parliament to use Brexit as an opportunity to change the constitutional settlement. And, and people have different views about this. I, I think it's highly problematic from a constitutional perspective. And then there's the question about legislative consent, which the Scottish and Welsh governments are recommending should be withheld, and, and how that is going to be worked out, we really don't know. But the second one problem is that it has a blanket reservation 
on existing EU laws and then says, well, certain powers will be released uh, afterwards uh, back to the devolved levels if they're not needed for UK purposes. And that's problematic because it makes it very difficult to get coherent policy making with whatever bits and pieces are going to be released. In fact, the language of releasing is, is problematic from a constitutional perspective uh, as well. And I think the, the UK government seems to have taken that on board. It has accepted that would need to be legislative consent uh, under the Sewell Convention. It hasn't said what will happen if it doesn't get it. We just don't know. <coughs> and it has promised uh, amendments, but we don't know what those uh, amendments uh, are. And I, I've suggested that the powers in Clause 11 are, are simply unnecessary. If we're going to have frameworks, we don't need to reserve the powers. If you have a framework, that's an alternative to reservation. Reserving the powers and then negotiating frameworks would mean the UK government is effectively negotiating with itself because they're no longer devolved powers. So I think it would be much more, more clearer if the UK were to make uh, uh, clear its position on this and say that, that Clause 11, which is about the blanket reservation, were to go, the devolved level could retain their own powers, and then you could get into negotiation. Just to, a final point about, about frameworks after that. There is a difference, it seems to me, in the emphasis of the Scottish and the Welsh governments, because the Scottish government seems to see frameworks as providing parameters for separate policies, whereas the Welsh government seems to be more keen on joint policies, joint UK-wide policies. But that's something that would work out in the, in the long run. In the immediate future, both Wales and Scotland are agreed that the re- centralization of these competences is, is highly problematic. How can, you, how can you negotiate with someone if they won't negotiate with you? How can you discuss anything if they won't give you what they, they're thinking? You know, where, where are we going to go in this? Is it going to go right up to the wire? I, I, if, you, if, you, if you want to give a broad answer no, to that, no, I, 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 because it's, it's, I, I'm not sure. Simple as that. I, I, I don't know, uh, but it does seem to me that the UK government has, uh, has indicated that it appreciates there is a problem here. Now, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. So, but, if you don't know the answer, you know, what chance has anyone else got? Uh, maybe in the fullness of time. Maybe I, I'm going to rein this back and go to Martin, because I think the original um, yes, yes, question... And, and, and I may have picked you up wrongly, and I want to, I want to totally, you know, we want to work with farmers. We want to ensure that we have the best food as we have in Scotland. How, what do we do? Give us your, uh, your options. First point in the withdrawal bill. Obviously, we see the withdrawal bill as being absolutely vital so that the wheels don't basically fall off the cap. That's, I think that's absolutely vital, because without that um, legislation coming over, basically cut and paste, we need to keep things running as is so that we don't. We've often talked about all the uncertainties that's been highlighted already, the uncertainties that are out there. If it goes completely wrong, we're going to fall off a cliff edge. And from a farming perspective, that's just not on. I mean, farming is a long-term uh, project. It's a long-term occupation. You know, you're farming for years ahead, and it's the, it's the best way to do that, to look after the land. So when it comes to what the Scottish Government can do, this is where transitional arrangements is absolutely vital. And we need that time, uh, budget security going forward and beyond so that we actually know that we've got security and stability in the industry because unless farmers are actually investing in their businesses, it can't actually you know, go on and provide more for the environment, address climate change issues, which we are, we are certainly looking at, and we can do that. OK, uh, sorry, just, just Richard. I'm, I'm, small, I'm, no, a Richard, small supplementary. Richard, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm going to leave that one there because I think we've taken that one about as far as we can. We have another... Uh, three, four f themes to get through. I'd like to move on to the next theme, which is John's. Thanks very much. I, th I think mine kind of follows on because we've talked about frameworks, we've talked about the withdrawal bill. So what about the UK white paper and the UK agriculture bill that we're expecting? Um, I mean, what should be in it? Uh, what would you like to see in it? Or conversely, what should not be in it? What would you not want to see in it? OK. Um, while, you, while you're pondering your answers, um, if I could just say, we are quite tight of time, so it, if, if you could select the subjects and, uh, that you can uh, carefully and succinctly, I'd be very grateful. Martin, do you want to kick off with that? 
Andrew, um, I think with regard to the, the white paper, or command paper, I think they're calling it now, it's been pushed back. We've been assured that was going to be coming, I think, in January. Earlier on, it's now pushed back to the spring. That's obviously going to be the precursor to the agricultural bill. I think the, the, the biggest thing about the command paper is it has to have the tools, or allow to have the tools in the toolbox to allow Scottish Government to do within reason what they want to do to, to create this bespoke policy, agricultural policy going forward. So it's absolutely vital that the command paper has that in it. It's, it, it. We need to have that flexibility. If that flexibility is not in the command paper and then going on to the agricultural bill, then it will limit to the extent what bespoke system the Scottish Government can actually implement. Um, I'm going to work down the panel because I think you've all sort of indicated you want to speak on that. So I'll go to Andrew and then Vicky, you're next. Um, Thank you, convener. I mean, essentially, as far, it, makes, it seems to make sense that it would follow from the withdrawal bill because the, con the discussions about the, the relationships between what, how, what gets reserved and, whether and how you develop con frameworks then has consequences for what goes into a command paper for agriculture. And until we get past the withdrawal bill, it would seem really difficult. I agree with Martin that we do need to find, have it formalised that Scotland is able to, that, that governance arrangement is able to sort of implement in ways that it sees fit. And if we can't have that, then there's a, an issue there, I think. Okay, Vicky. I think my comments are in a similar vein and very much following on from what the outcomes of the withdrawal bill are. We might expect that there will be some areas where a UK bill deals with UK issues and may well say something about frameworks and how these things are, are set up. But our understanding is that largely that bill will then deal with England. And Michael Gove has been very specific about talking about a policy for England and presumably will require primary legislation to be able to uh, do the mechanics for enacting that policy in England. So I would imagine a large part of it will be relating to that. But there will obviously be some UK elements, one would imagine, of that bill. I mean, if I could just come in at this point, um, again, the... I mean, I'm kind of puzzled, I suppose, because if it's very free-ranging and allows a lot of freedom, I don't know how the money gets split up. It might actually then say in this bill 16% will go to Scotland. But on the other hand, if it's a kind of UK cap version, which is quite tight and specific and says that money will go for clean water, then it, it wouldn't specifically mention the finances, but that would lead on to Scotland having a certain proportion. So the, it just seems to me there's a lot of uncertainty around this. The, the more certainty that goes in the bill, the more we'll know. The less certainty in the bill, the, the less we'll know. Is that, is, that, is that fair or is that unfair? Um, Michael, do you, do you want to come and come and I'd like to bring you in on this, but uh, it, and then we might have to I, I was going to make a very, a very single, similar uh, a point. Is this going to be a UK bill or an England bill? They should be uh, consistent. Is there going to be legislative consent? The UK government says yes for the UK wide uh, matters, but then how far is it going to prescribe policies and particularly funding? Because we're talking too much about competence and not enough about funding. If it is said, yes, there will be UK wide agricultural priorities, A, B and C, they will have funding attached to them, then you may not be reserving the competences, but you're reserving control effectively. That, that's absolutely critical. And so far, we, we, we don't really know. Uh, and there's a danger, if this happens, that agricultural policy will effectively be driven by policy in England, even though, in a formal sense, the competences are still devolved. Carmen, would you like to come in on that? And then we'll move on to our next theme. I don't think I have any specific uh, okay. uh, to add, but I do agree with Michael very much. OK, so the next theme is uh, Jamie. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, the discussion to talk about trade and future trade. It's obviously an intrinsic part of the uh, Brexit process. Um, and today, obviously, at this point, we've got no idea what relationship the UK will have with the EU post-Brexit uh, or any uh, interim periods, and indeed any relationships that we may have with other third-party countries outside of the EU in terms of trading relationships. Um, so. I guess what I'd like to explore briefly uh, is the panel's views on any, A, opportunities that this unique situation presents us, but B, any specific or known risks that it also creates for the agricultural industry in Scotland at the moment. Um, I, I will give you all a chance uh, to come in. I'm going I'm to take Martin and then Carmen. Okay, uh, thank you, Convener. 
There are um, a lot of risks and there are a lot of opportunities. Um, the, the, the greatest risk we have, trade is absolutely paramount. Trade, if trade deals go in our favour, that will have the biggest um, relevance to, to Scottish farmers and, 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 and crofters in, in Scotland, because if trade deals go in our favour, it will make a, a huge difference. If they go against us, and when I say go against us, I mean by making trade deals, we actually export our own welfare standards by importing, whether it be um, substandard product, whether it's um, you know, hormone-fed beef, whether it's uh, how animals are raised, how feed is grown um, in other countries, not just in the EU, uh, I think it's going to be probably the biggest, biggest relevance to the uh, prosperity of Scottish agriculture. And we have got some, I'm not saying the highest standards in the world, but some of the highest standards in the world when it comes to welfare standards for animals and growing standards for our crops. And if we make deals, and this is, comes back to a comment I made earlier on, we need to be very, very wary of unintended consequences of wrong decisions, and I think that's why the industry need to be really taken on board of what, of, in recognition of what we're actually providing um, within Scottish agriculture. So trade is absolutely, tra trade is absolutely paramount. Um, there are opportunities, though, as well. So if we can see opportunities where we can export to other countries, what we need to remember in Scotland is 80% of our produce just goes across the border. But when it comes to lamb, over 90% of our export of lamb goes into the EU. So it's absolutely vital we can have that friction-free trade within the EU. That's, that's vital because we're in a, a very perishable commodity. You know, it's not like we can have a, a vehicle sitting somewhere for three months and it won't make any difference. We've got per perishable commodities stuck because of um, uh, you know, customs uh, issues. Uh, that's that's a, a big challenge. So there are a number of risks there and you know industry need to be involved with and consulted on when it comes to making trade deals. I'm going to bring Carmen in and Jamie if you want to then add something and then I'll bring the other panel members in. So Carmen if you'd, if, if you'd like to say. Yeah. No, you, you, you lead on. Okay. Carmen. Uh, I do have a, a, a lot on trade uh, but I I just try to summarize. Maybe I should say that I, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm leading a, a big project, so, uh, <coughs> which is funded by the Economic and Research Council in England, which actually looks at the impact of Brexit um, at the sector level, but also at the farm level, and it covers all countries. So we look at the UK, but also the different, the, the different countries, and we look at impact on production, consumption, changing in prices, uh, impact exports. We also try to look at um, uh, the profitability of farms uh, and also we will try to identify uh, those sectors which are actually most vulnerable. We have done already some work. I brought with me uh, some, uh, some, uh, some papers which I can leave it with you, but this, uh, was, uh, the results here are preliminary and they were done in November. Since then we progress a lot. But just try to summarize. So we, we run three scenarios uh, on trade and also we run scenarios in which we eliminate uh, direct payments or we keep direct payments. Uh, the scenarios are probably, as you may expect, is a free trade agreement with the EU. It's a W default and also we have a very extreme scenario, which I call it um, extreme liberalization in which the UK liberalized its, its, its trade with, with the EU and the rest of the country, with the rest of the world, but actually will face uh, tariffs uh, for uh, its exports. Um, and our results show that so far, um, probably as expected, that a free trade agreement with the EU uh, will have uh, marginal changes for production prices, the value of output. Uh, but then uh, WTO, when you look at Scotland, actually is not as bad as some of people may think about it. Uh, uh, double, under the WTO, um, I would like to think that it's the um uh, it's WTO actually without direct payments. I should have said that what do you think it's important when we analyze trade? You have to think about it, the trade status, net import net importer versus net exporters. That will make a difference. That will make a difference to the sector. And based on that status, then you have different, different, um, different impacts. Uh, so without direct payments, 
everybody, will, of course, will be affected. Uh, under WTO, I don't think it's as bad as, as people may think about, with the exception probably with beef and sheep sectors, but probably you expect that. But what I think is interesting is actually the dairy sector in, in um, in Scotland, might not do as bad as we as we as we, we think, except under the, the unilateral trade agreement. Uh, I do have some nice graphs, and I have some things which I can probably share with you. And we do have to have um, uh, something done by the end of June. And in September, we will present our results uh, um, in um, in a joint event with the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board in England. Common, thank you very much. You, you made an uh, offer of some papers there. What I'd say is the clerks will contact you after the committee yeah. meeting and, and, and arrange to, to get copies of those so they can be circulated to the committee. Um, I'm, I'm very nervous about time, and, and Vicky, I'll bring you in very briefly, and then Michael, if he wants to come in. So it's just to say we, we'd also commissioned some research looking at the impacts of Brexit and trade scenarios for farmers, but then the knock-on consequences for farm and wildlife, and that was a UK study, and we'd be happy to make that available. Clearly, there are some sectors which are vulnerable depending upon the trade agreements we, we <coughs> end up with, uh, particularly in terms of beef and sheep and, and in, in the LFA. Um, we're really concerned about that from an environmental perspective because that's our high nature value farming areas where some of our most important species and habitats reside uh, and their future is very dependent on the future of those farming and crofting systems. So in a sense our domestic policy will need to be a response to those trade agreements that we strike and the regimes we, we follow and the impacts those then have and we may well need to ameliorate some of the effects of that through domestic policy including uh, supporting farmers for the public goods that they deliver particularly which is one of the, 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 their strengths as it were as opposed to perhaps in some cases some of the market outputs from those systems. Michael, I'm happy to bring you in briefly before we move on to the next yeah, theme. No, if no, there's no, something. Have to leave. Yeah, well, well tra trade, of course, is constitutionally reserved, uh, so that will be a UK responsibility, but it impacts on the devolved levels. Very few freight trade agreements have free trade in agriculture because it tends to be uh, protected and, and regulated separately. There is a big difference between those who would want global free trade in agriculture, no tariffs, which would have enormous impacts upon sectors within the UK and within Scotland, and those who want to keep uh, support. Uh, and finally, whatever free trade agreements we negotiate in agriculture will have in them elements and agreements about regulation and support. That is not just a domestic matter, because our trading partners would want to know we have the same standards, and they would want to know we have have a level playing field and are not subsidising our producers more than they're uh, subsidising theirs. So the two are intimately connected. I'm going to leave that there. Th uh, thank you. Um, the next question is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. I want to talk about standards, and we've already touched on these, Martin. You um, mentioned it with regard to trade, and um, Vicky, you talked about some shared conclusions between the two reports that we were talking about. And the interim report from the National Council of Rural Advisors and also the Greening Group discussion paper, Professor uh, Russell Griggs mentioned the legislation that's already in place with regards to standards, um, things like natural capital, animal plant and product standards, um, and the environmental protections that we have for our soil, air, water and biodiversity. So with regards to these, um, I know that we are short on time. If you want to limit it to maybe two that you would like to see remain as being very important and any ones that you would like to see changed. Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Gail. And, and, and let me help you. You would like to limit it to two that you'd like to keep and two that you'd like to change. Um, so I don't know who'd like to, to kick off on that. Martin, we'll work down the line then, Martin. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gavina. I, I, I don't know if we need to limit it to two. I think all our standards is absolutely uh, critical, and, and uh, I think that's part of where we get our trade deals from. Because of the standards we actually have, that's, um, it's a, a, a feather in our cap when it comes to making trade deals, and I think it's something we want to hold on to. As soon as we start dropping some of our standards, there are some regulations there, I, I need to add, um, that, 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 that could be changed. But with regard to standards, I think it's our highest selling point. 
and it's something that um, you know we, we talk about um, you know, uh, you know good, a good British product. Well, we, we see the Scottish product as being premium British, to be quite honest, and and uh, and I think it's something we need to hold on to. It's it's the biggest part of our our selling point when it comes to trade. So standards, I think we need to actually at least maintain. Okay, that, that was a politician's answer. You're not dropping any standards. And, and Andrew, do you want to add anything to that? Very similar. Um, we, as an organisation, we uh, basically came out in, in a pragmatic stance and said that um, in order to achieve any transition towards a, a new sort of uh, post-Brexit regime, we should maintain where we are. And then once we've got through that that transition, then we should st start thinking about that. But I agree in terms of the selling point that standards are... Vicky, do you want yeah. to? Uh, well, absolutely. Our high standards underpin Scotland's brand. Um, we actually welcome the existing statements which have already been made by the Scottish Government around um, maintaining environmental standards in particular, but also to important principles that the EU sets in terms of polluter pays and the precautionary principle, which we think should also come, come back into our domestic legislation. If I, if I had to pick two things that I think... Um, uh, comes from European legislation, which is vitally important. I would probably pick the Birds and Habitats Directive and the Water Framework Directive as, as fundamentally underpinning um, protecting our most important species uh, and habitats and ensuring that we tackle problems such as diffuse pollution and ensure we have good quality drinking water and our rivers and locks are, are clean. Okay, thank you. I Comment. absolutely agree with everything has been uh, told so far. Uh, just to add, probably we should not lose the um, geographical indication. So the indicators related to the uh, product designated of origins and uh, the others related to geographical indication, which I think are very important for the UK as a whole, and particularly for Scotland. Okay, thank, thank you for that. that, that. <laughs> As we didn't get a specific answer that, and we were keeping all the standards, I think, Vicky, you did give us a specific answer. So thank you. Uh, we can move on to the final theme, which is Collins. Thank you much, Convener. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, within CAP, the, the Scottish Government are obviously part of a, an, a current EU audit process that obviously protects farmers from, from fraudulent claims and, and sets clear rule, rules for government. What do you think should replace that EU audit process? audit. Um, who, who'd like to start on that? Martin. Well, I think when it, when it comes down to audit, um, every government should be held accountable for, for, for whatever happens. So um, post-Brexit, um, as I understand it, we already have a, a, a UK-wide audit committee. So um, am, am I getting the right vein of this? So, so um, when it comes to going forward, and we have our own um, policy direction, I think there needs to be an overarching um, audit that over all four home nations that actually makes sure that we're not, none of us are actually stepping out of line. But when I say none of us, I mean governments, because it needs to be audited that whatever delivery process is happens, happens in future agricultural policy is audited correctly. One thing we need to make sure, and w w we talked about earlier on about having bespoke systems, that bespoke system has a hopefully a wide variance, but not to the detriment of UK intra-UK trade. So it needs to be that audit needs to, to overarch that process of looking after delivery of future agricultural policy um, and, and keeping a, an, an element of intra-UK trade um, free and accessible, so, if that makes sense. So just to help, that, that's on quite a uh, high level uh, thing. Do, 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 I'm, thought you might, somebody might want to mention auditing right down to the lower level. So, Andrew, bearing that in mind, I'm going to go down the panel. Andrew, do you want to? Um, we, in, in, in a similar way to my answer to the last question in terms of um, standards, it, with audit, we have taken a position again that we probably need to maintain the status quo in the short to medium term in order to just keep um, sort of things moving with systems that we're familiar with. Um, the, we also, I think, have to be realistic in terms of who want to have frictionless trade with the EU. We will probably have to maintain certain audit standards that meet their requirements. So um, e even if we think that there might be opportunities to reduce audit um, burden, then we still actually need to maintain those markets. Um, the, as we move to a new system further in the future, 
There may be opportunities, but it will all be critically dependent on the sort of system we create. So there are certain sorts of things that happen at field level in terms of inspections and so on, which you know, offer opportunities. But until we know more about the structure through which we intend to support farming, it will be difficult to then design an audit system that is that provides less of a burden unless we you know start with it in that we, we if you start with it in that in that um if you start with reducing the burden in the first place and then try and work that way then you know you can create one sort of policy but we need to work from what do we want the public money to deliver to make it defensible and and uh, and you need the re audit requirements so in some respects all i'm saying is we we have to accept there will be an audit burden there may be some opportunities to reduce that burden, but we'll have to see as we develop the systems in the future. Okay, Vicky, I noticed you're nodding, so before I let you answer that, I'm going to let Colin come back with a follow-up and then maybe bring, bring you and Carmen in. Vicky may wish to touch on, but do you think as the, the replacement is brought forward, we'll require new institutions, for example, to check on environmental compliance? Okay, I, I'll, I'll come to that specific, if I may, just, just generally, then obviously if we're spending public money in order to deliver certain outputs, we need to have inspection and compliance regimes to make sure we're delivering those, those outcomes. So uh, I agree with Andrew, there's an ine inevitable burden there, although we can obviously, I think, do a lot to improve on some of the current frustrations that, that we have uh, as part of the, the CAP system. Um, and I think there will be, uh, n I mentioned earlier, new ways and new approaches we can test. There's a lot of interest in results-based approaches to environmental schemes for example, and engaging farmers more in the process of uh, monitoring and evaluation and, and testing what's happening uh, on the farm. I mean, in terms of more broadly, in terms of uh, accountability and um, enforcement of our laws and legislations, then clearly there is a governance gap as things come back from the EU. The EU institutions fulfil certain roles at the moment through the Commission, the Parliament, the European Court of Justice in terms of holding member states to account and ensuring that they are uh, enforcing and enacting European legislation. And the question is, where, where does that sit when, when it comes back? And again, it's a little bit like the, the frameworks issue. Um, it's quite likely there will be a need, we think, for a body or bodies or institution or institutions to replace those functions and to be able to to hold governments, in a sense, to account and ensure that we're not infringing the laws that we're setting ourselves. Now, clearly, there's a role for Parliament in that, but but th that's a, that's a big job in itself, and I'm sure it's beyond uh, the time and resources of, of, of members such as yourselves to, to kind of do that level of scrutiny. So something is probably going to have to be put in place, I think, to replace some of the functions that are currently done by EU institutions. Thank you, Vicky, and I'm going to let Carmen, if you'd like to have the no. Oh, thank you. Further oh. for the comments. Perfect. I agree so, with everything. Vicky, you. Um, you have had the last word on that. Um, I'm afraid we, we have run out of time. Uh, well, Martin, if you really quickly, I can break. Very briefly, just to talk about, well, I did talk about that sort of higher level audit, but when it comes to down, down to farm level audit, um, I mean, farmers are audited fairly heftily at the present time, and whether we need a replacement um, sort of audit body above what we have at the present time, I really don't think so. I think I would ag agree with Andrew. What we have in place at the present time would, would suffice. Okay. Well, that's probably a, a, a consensual point to end it. So thank you very much, uh, Martin, Andrew, Vicky and Carmen for giving evidence this morning. Uh, we, we, I think the fact that the session has been pushed for time shows the, the interest in the subject. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm briefly going to suspend the meeting now to allow the changeover of the panels. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm now going to reconvene uh, the meeting with the second panel this morning to discuss fisheries. Uh, I'd like to welcome Simon Collins, representing the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, James Cook, the director of Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation, Dr. James Harrison, senior lecturer in international law at the University of Edinburgh, Callum Duncan, the head of Conservation Scotland, Marine Conservation Society, and Andrew Charles, the vice chair, Scottish Seafood Association. We have a number of themes that we're going to run through, which will be introduced by the members of the committee. Um, and if those of you who have done this before know that you don't have to push any of the buttons uh, on the machinery in front of you, it will happen automatically. What you do have to do, though, is to catch my eye. And if you catch my eye, I will, I will bring you in to speak. I will try and bring everyone in. It's a question of managing uh, the situation to make sure um, that everyone gets a fair chance. Um, so the first theme is from Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. And uh, I want to uh, ask uh, the panel specifically about the, the coming out of the common fisheries policy. Um, other themes will cover what happens after that. Um, and I think it'd be fair to say that the, uh, the fishermen who fish beyond the 12 mile limit out to 200 miles are perhaps the area of our community who have the most obvious opportunity for benefit but it isn't unconditional. And I just want to ask uh, some, some questions around that. Um, in particular, uh, about uh, quota and how that might work across the transition. Uh, Iceland has 10% of its uh, catch caught by non-Icelandic uh, boats. Norway is 16%, but we have 60%. And the 10% and 16% Iceland and Norway, of course, is traded off for the benefit of fishing, whereas our 60%, it's not clear we get any particular uh, benefit from that. And I just uh, wonder in the first instance, uh, what process should be put in place for coming out of the CFP uh, to manage that particular aspect, knowing that the Scottish Fishermen Federation are very clear that the starting position has to be 100% of the quota is owned and controlled by, by Scotland. That may not be the view of everyone. Simon, do you want to start off on that? Thanks, Convener. Yes, thanks, Stuart. And, and thanks again. I'm glad you're here because Stuart was one of the, you might remember, one of the first people he, he came forward with the debate in the Scottish Parliament on the Sea of Opportunity as well. So he was the first really to, one of the first to recognise the opportunity for that part of the catching sector. Our position, um, the, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, is that the control is essential. And that means control over access because without that, we're not in a strong position in any reasonable time frame to wrestle fairer shares of internationally agreed quotas back for our vessels. Access, because a lot of the, the species we're talking about, almost all, in fact, um, they are far, the, the, the EU fleet that catches them, that arrives at the 60% that is taken out of our waters by them, because they, in most cases, are unable to catch it anywhere else, by and large, they need access in order to fill their quotas. If we retain control of access, then we're in a strong position, extremely strong position, to then demand that if any of them require access, and of course they do, then they should be prepared to give up some of their quota in order to have it. Now, you could have an extreme position where you say, the access, which we insist should be 100% in our control, are we therefore going to require all of the quota that falls within our waters? In the long term, that's a reasonable objective. It's our natural resource after all. In the medium term, of course, there are good arguments, political arguments, mainly for saying, well, maybe we shouldn't have an adjustment that's not immediate. So you can imagine a situation where EU vessels are continued to allowed back into our waters in return for some handover, if you like, of quota, for example, to our vessels, um, as you like, as, as an expedient. But that is nothing to do with ceding the principle of control. That's absolutely essential. That is why we're getting nervy, or we get nervous sometimes around talk of transition periods, where there is an implication sometimes that control should be part of that, or conceding control, or conceding long-term shares of access, long-term quota shares, all that should be part of some deal. We don't want any part of that. We insist that control comes back to us, because at that point, we can then be as generous or as aggressive as we like with quota. The important thing is we stick within the overall pot. How much of it we claim is a political choice which is made in annual talks as it is in Norway, Iceland, Faroe and many other places. So 
Not 100% <laughs> of the quota on day one, that would be unreasonable, but 100% of the control, that's extremely important to us. Others' views, can I just ask for some clarity, because I'm in slight doubt, that the Scottish Fishermen's Federation is looking at the transition point being aligned with the end of the A calendar year, because that is the point that relates to negotiations that currently exist. And in the first year, 2019, you're three months in, broadly, nine months out, that really the best time is at the end of that negotiating period. Is that the SFF's current position? That, that is absolutely correct. Because the annual quota cycle is year end to year end, and there's a whole cycle of talks with not just within the EU, but with third countries that set opportunities for the following year, for the sake of business st uh, stability among, above everything else, it doesn't make sense for a, gr a deal struck on quota at the end of this year, 2018, to be torn up three months into the fishing year. Apart from anything else, apart from the, the dam damage that does, we don't know, even our vessels wouldn't know what they're, they're up to after that, apart from the damage that that would cause. The fact is that if we even were to say, well, we're going to renegotiate a whole bunch of quota from the end of March 2019 onwards, the timing of it, in any case, should run pretty much to the end of 19 anyway. So you might as well, for the sake of stability, for clarity for everyone, just say, as long as we, the UK and therefore Scotland, gets a good deal at the end of year talks this year, when we're part of the EU, then there's no reason why we could run that arrangement, that agreement for 2019, right to the end of the calendar year 2019. It just fits in with the science, it fits in with the annual, the annual cycle of talks. It's not a, a concession. We, we don't call it a transition arrangement or anything like that. We just call it a bridge, because that's all, that's all it is. It's a business stability issue. James in, if I may, please. Uh, hold on, sorry. Wrong James. Oh, right, right. Um, James. Now, I'm going to have to call you Dr. James, or we're going to get further confusion. So, uh, or, or I could say James on my left. <laughs> Um, I, I think I would agree to, with that to some extent, but this really depends upon uh, the nature of the stock and where the stocks are located and who can fish them. I mean, many of the stocks are transboundary. Um, some of our stocks even straddle into the high seas. And for those sorts of stocks, you really need some kind of agreement on a quota in order for a fisheries management system to work. Uh, we've had situations in the Northeast Atlantic over a number of years where coastal states have un been unable to agree on a quota or the share of a quota, and that's led to unilateralism and overfishing, and that's not good for, for anybody. Uh, now, international law, and that's what I teach and research at the University in Edinburgh, uh, imposes a duty of cooperation on states to, to try and agree on total allowable catches and quotas. It doesn't prescribe how they should do that, and there are clearly different views among the EU and the UK about how quotas should be allocated. And that's going to be one of the most difficult issues coming up. There, there's no common practice around the world on allocating quota. Uh, and there's a big difference between using historical catches, um, which is what's been done under relative stability in the EU, and so-called zonal attachment. Neither has a priority, and it's going to be a matter of compromise. OK. Does, that, does anyone else want to come in on that? Um... Sorry, yeah, uh, Callum. Um, thank you. J just to back up the, the point of principle there, which is that the, um, the opportunity here is to, uh, is to must be seized to make uh, fishing even more sustainable and fisheries management even more sustainable. And the important, the things that we'd like to focus on are the important principles to ensure that, which is to follow the science. And, and James has alighted on those points, talking about straddling stocks. And I said to the committee almost a year ago, similarly talking about the other side of that ecological equation, where you've got the most viable stock in Scotland is mackerel, and that spawns off, off Ireland elsewhere in the EU. And there'll be lots of other examples as well. Um, so, you know, our, our chief concern is that the, uh, uh, you know, all, all, all fisheries management is, is done based on, on sound science, uh, following the principles that we heard my colleague Vicky talk about earlier in terms of the precautionary principle uh, and, uh, and ecosystem-based principles as well. So, you know, f fish and shellfish, it's easy to get into the quota. And people, 
people start thinking about them as a you know a, a bar and a chart, but these are these are these are wild animals that happen to be tasty, you know. So they're part of the ecosystem. So what, what we're coming at it from is that the um, you know the, the opportunities there to to improve uh, fisheries management um, must be uh, you know within the context of securing good environmental status, uh, for example, within within the wi wider marine environment. So we have you know we have to look at we, we you know we have to look at that wider picture, and then allocate stock quota effort according to. Um, the carrying capacity of, of the marine ecosystem and, the, the, and you know, where, where the fish and shellfish spawn, where, they, where the different parts of their life history are, um, where they feed and breed, and, uh, and, and provide pr protection as well as part of that. So um, the, the other thought, just while we're talking on quota, is n not that I'm necessarily advocating this, but it's interesting to look at what they're doing in the Faroes, where they're asserting that... Um, uh, you know, fish, the fish belong, fish and shellfish belong to the people of, of the Faroe Islands. And, uh, you know, th there's some interesting examples we should look at from other countries as well um, going forwards. Stuart, can I bring you back in there? Yeah, I've got a, a small point to make. Now, we will cover trade and we will cover the London Fisheries Convention later in our, our, our sequence. Uh, but I just wanted to ask the creelers in particular, who are largely inside the 12 mile limit and therefore largely detached directly from the CFP, uh, whether there are any issues related to the leaving, uh, leaving aside, as I say, London fisheries and trade, which I think is probably a primary concern. James uh, Cook, that's definitely you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. I think, um, speaking on behalf of the Renshaw group, that it's, it's not really applicable to them. There's only mild issues uh, around Langestine for Creelcott Langestine, which... Um, <coughs> They don't really actually catch that quota anyway because it's a high volume product and it's a low volume product. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a very big, big component of um, Scottish exports. Uh, I think we, we would fully support that uh, SFF you know, fight for 100% of quota because I think that, that's a very logical stance to, to improve everybody's opportunities within the, the fishing community. You know. There are a few, uh, which I think Andrew will probably illuminate you on later on, there's frustrations that if this fishery does grow, that uh, in Scotland we won't be able to exploit that fully because of lack of investment in processors. But uh, to get back to the main issue, um, we only have um, a marginal amount of uh, Creole static gear fishermen that now fish outside the 12 mile limit. They have no real quota restrictions at the moment, so they're free to fish as and when required. Um, there's, no, there's no any TAC for lobster or brown crab. So, um, you know, I think um, going forward, um, it's something that does need address, but we would fully support the SFF in their quest to gain 100%. Andrew, this is your chance to, to follow that on. Yes, if, from a processing perspective, 100% of the quota would be the right avenue to go. I, I would never... Uh, go down the road, though, of, of excluding the European boats from our waters completely. But if a Scottish fisherman wishes to buy quota, they pay for it. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity to take your revenue stream from the European fleets and then reinvest it back into the industry. I think you've got a massive opportunity here to do that. And that would be a great way to manage it by slowly then hopefully taking more and more back over a long period of time. OK, I think we'll move on to the next theme. Um, that seems the logical place. Mike. Um. Thank you, Convener. Um, my theme is really the... Well, we know there's a UK fisheries bill expected soon, UK-wide. So uh, enable, to enable the UK to exercise responsibility for access to fisheries and the management of our waters. So my question really is, uh, what does the panel have any concerns about what will be or what will not be in the forthcoming bill. Who'd like to, uh, Simon, you, you seem prepared for that one. Yeah, yes, that, thank, thank you, thank you, Convener. Yet, I, if the fisheries bill, we, we were told, as we were all told in the Queen's speech, that it would be pretty much limited to high level principles, um, the legal powers to control um, access to our waters or what will become our waters, which of course for us is very important, 
and equally important, the powers, the legal powers to set fishing opportunities, which in the end boil down to quotas. In, in our view, it would be very, very important that the fisheries bill sticks to that. Um, but there's a, I'm sure there's a very wide measure of consensus about the high level principles governing fisheries management. But I'd be very, very wary of the UK Parliament delving into anything more and adding bits on because they sound like a good idea at the time. Those responsibilities, and, and the Federation, we said that in this, in this Parliament on, on many occasions, those responsibilities we are convinced rightfully belong here. It makes sense of fisheries management to have as much of the day to day stuff as possible being devolved to Scotland. The last thing you want in a fisheries bill to have no end of what sound like good ideas appended to this very simple structure. So our plea would be keep it simple and to the point and let, after that, let the devolved administrations take their responsibilities afterwards. So I'm looking down the line to see if anyone, no one's really catching my eye. J James Harrison is, I, Andrew, I don't know if you, are you trying? Uh, I would like to see in a bill the, the highlighting the importance of fish processing. It's a unique industry. It's one of our last industries that actually processes a wild product and it is unique it's not like engineering it's not like manufacturing and it's certainly not like oil factories in in, in in central cities and it does have it does need to be nurtured and it's important if you're going to have and maximize the full value of what we're about to get here which is poss potentially a much larger share of the cake that we do have the processing facilities to maximize that profit in our regions and breathe life back into our uh, coastal communities. If James we don't, Harris it's an opportunity lost. Sorry, thank you, Andrew. J James Harrison, do you want to? I would just add that as, as important as a fisheries bill is the way that any, uh, what will become retained EU law uh, under the EU withdrawal bill is adapted. I mean, there's a constitutional question of who should be responsible for adapting retained EU law, which we can put aside, but how that is adapted, how the existing uh, common fisheries framework in Europe is then somehow amended to make sense for the UK um, is just as important, if not more important, than what's going to be in a framework fisheries bill uh, before the UK Parliament. Um, Mike, do you want to follow that up? Or... I'm fine. Sorry, Callum and, and James. Okay, yeah. I'll okay. take you, Callum, and then James. Okay, Cook. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd echo what the last two speakers said, and similar to what Simon was saying, we'd prefer um, the Fisheries Bill to be simple and in primary legislation <coughs> to avoid um, uh, the potential... Um, lack of parliamentary scrutiny that secondary legislation might lead to. So, simple and in primary legislation. But again, as we've just heard, it's really important, and as I said to committee before, to have that, that four country agreement around how we manage fisheries. So, that at the very least must respect the current devolution settlement, and there's obviously scope to go further than that as well. And, you know, I think we're hearing similar um, uh, f from, from other witnesses. Um, and if, if I can just take the opportunity to, to highlight some of the principles that we'd like to see that legislation reflect, that, I'd be grateful. Um, I touched the one before. Fish are a public resource and must be managed for long-term sustainability using precautionary ecosystem-based approaches. Um, fishing limits must be set in line with best available science to make sure stocks are managed below MSY. Fishing opportunities allocated on the basis of transparent and objective environmental, social and environmental criteria, an inclusive, transparent and re robust government's framework to deliver fully documented fisheries, just a couple, and just one more, <laughs> and high environmental standards the legislation should secure for um, everybody fishing in UK waters, but also UK vessels fishing um, elsewhere in, in non-UK waters as well. So th those are the, the key things that we'd like to see from the legislation. Callum, just before we move on... Uh, yeah. the no, sorry, just for uh, clarification, could you maybe tell the committee what MSY means? Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Uh, that's maximum sustainable yield. Thank you. So, pardon the jargon. So, um, it, you know, it, it, fishery science is very complex, so it's, it's not an exact <coughs> science. So, you, you, if you're trying to aim for what science thinks is the maximum sustainable yield, you risk overshooting it. So, the best thing to do is have enough... Be, be comfortable that your stock biomass is big enough and that your fishing mortality is low enough that you can be sure you're the, within that maximum sustainable yield. Okay. 
James Cook, you would like to come in there. Yes, well, I agree with uh, my colleagues here. Um, but one, one area that we would like to focus on is that the inshore fisheries uh, seem to be lost in the, the focus for the bigger fisheries. Um, we would like um, some recognition of their contribution, uh, given the limited amount of fishing opportunities that they get. Um, and uh, we've underlined this in several papers, that uh, given more access to more waters without gear conflict, uh, they would give a much uh, better contribution to the, the economy, especially on the west coast of Scotland. I think this is more paramount to their, uh, their opportunities and fishing opportunities. And also, we would like to, uh, some recognition of the fact without producers' organisations, we have no access to quota, uh, which means that we can't access some of the key species that, that are in the fishing grounds uh, at key times of year. They're not all year-round fisheries, but there's opportunities historically on fishing grounds where herring and mackerel are available, but access to these are, are not formally recognised. And we would like to improve fishing opportunities for, for all these inshore boats. Um, it's been proved by some of the handline fisheries that it's created a mini regeneration of economies and, and small communities. Uh, and I think there's evidence out there to support that. In my own area, I, Mouth St Abs, uh, there's been a huge uh, investment in smaller boats with the fishing opportunities for a single fishery handline mackerel. So we, we, on the background to that, we would like some sort of recognition of uh, fishing opportunities. And uh... James, could you just clarify for me, you said that you, on the West Coast there were limited opportunities. Just clarify what, the, what are the limits on the, on the opportunities for, for fishing on the West Coast within the 12 month? Just well, a quick... Uh, well, without getting too messy, and it's a, it's a prickly subject, I think gear conflict is one of the main Sorry? Gear, gear conflict uh, with the mobile sector, you know, and uh, the scallop dredgers. Uh, that limits uh, inshore fisheries because they're, they're more or less uh, condensed in a single safe area where they can operate, you know, yeah. uh, which means they're denied fishing opportunities in a lot of fishing areas. MPAs have... Um, opened the debate on this and they've proved very successful because of the, you know, the, the displacement of, uh, you know, catches coming from these MPAs. It's been proved that there is a, there has a small bonus already and it's a very new, it's a very new fishing opportunity for them. So on the back of that, we would like to, you know, raise everybody's awareness. Okay. Um, sorry, if, if, I mean, I'm just thinking about, uh, about the, the, the people watching this. Some people may not pick up what MPAs are. And if you're going to use acronyms, if I could just ask oh, you right, just right, to right. introduce them to start with. Yes. And, and that just saves for the broadcast. Yes. Peter, you wanted to come in very briefly, I think, before we move on to the next theme, which is Fulton McGregor. Very, very briefly, I mean, you, you spoke about getting access to more water. Does that mean outside the 12 mile limit, or, does, or are you speaking about MPAs when you say that? No, I, I think there's opportunities in, in several areas. I think the West Coast is particularly, you know, problematic because of the, the geography of the coastline, you know, and there are fishing opportunities there. But it's been proven that with the MPAs and, and being able to static gear, being able to access them, it's been very beneficial. Uh, and we feel if it's if the marine protected areas are supported by uh, all the, the proper uh, you know, groups, I, I think it will be very beneficial and, and increase fishing opportunities. It, it's a very young, as I say, but the evidence is certainly shown there already. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to the next theme, which is Fulton McGregor. Thanks, uh, convener. The, uh, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, policy in the marine environment. I appreciate, uh, Callum Duncan, that you've touched on this in one of your earlier answers in a quote um, in a briefing back here from the London School of Economics when they state that one of the key failings of the common fisheries policy was its failure to directly incorporate environmental legislation. How does the panel think the fisheries policy prospect directs it linked with management and governance of marine ecosystems? Okay, who'd like to... Um, Callum, I, I, I'm sure you'd like to get on that one. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, yes, thank you, Fulton. I did touch on that earlier and I was... Um, Echoing that, you know, emphasising fish and shellfish are obviously part of the marine ecosystem, um, and that's where we uh, value the marine strategy framework directive that um, you know places fisheries management in that in that wider range of management that we need to look at to achieve good environmental status by by 2020, and those 
uh, that, that directive is transposed into um, the UK Marine Strategy Regulations 2010, and um, the, uh, the out, a lot of the outputs of the, 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 both the Scottish and the UK Marine Act in terms of marine planning, the, the marine protected area network that we've heard about, um, you know, these are uh, important management tools uh, that fishing has to operate in, in the context of um, uh, the, the national, the Scotland's Marine Atlas highlighted fishing as, along with climate change, being one of the, the, the two most widespread pressures in Scotland's seas. So we all want to see a thriving, uh, sustainable fishing industry in Scotland, a mixed fishery, a mixed diverse fishery that also um, uh, ensures there's sustainable benefits from the inshore as well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in, or in, order to, um, in order to secure those, those benefits, both for those, you know, operating the fishers, but also the onshore processors and the communities that, um, that they support. You know, we all want to keep the lights on around the, around the coast, is a phrase I've heard, and, and we're absolutely four square behind that. Um, but to do that, we need to be starting, you know, that starting place needs to be looking at the, the you know, the health of the ecosystem. Uh, uh, because again, as I've touched on, you know, we know that, we know that your, the nephrops burrow in mud. We know that mud communities are also associated with whiting. We know that gravels and sands are associated with cod and, and some other ground fish. Um, you know, the, so, we, you know, we need to be looking, we need to be looking at our marine environment spatially and temporally and, and managing fisheries with the grain of the ecosystem so w that we continue to secure the benefits um, uh, for, you know, for, for, for Scotland as a whole and particularly those coastal communities. Um, so, that's where that, so that's where those frameworks are really important. I mean, I've got the National Marine Plan, Scotland's National Marine Plan here, and, and it's got ecosystem objectives in it. For example, management of fisheries on a regional sea, sea base and ecosystem basis with appropriate stakeholders empowered in the decision-making process and, and so on. So there's, you know, we, we, we've, we've got layers of um, frameworks already in place. Uh, I'll, sorry, I'll finish in a minute. There's one, there's one last one on this, which was, um, it, just to go back to the four country point, there's, uh, there's an agreed UK marine policy statement going back uh, quite a number of years which recognised the overall aim of, um, at the time it was saying reformed CFP, but we can insert into that new fisheries management arrangements, should be to attain ecological sustainability and could contribute to the delivery of effective management of our seas and be integrated into wider marine policy. So there's, there's a lot of frameworks in UK-wide agreements and four country agreements there, um, as well as these international frameworks. and. Um, uh, those are absolutely key for sustainable fishing and fisheries management. Um, quite a full answer there. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to bring Andrew in, and then if I may, I'd like to look at the next theme, uh, Fulton, unless you've got something to come back on. Um, Andrew. From a processor's perspective in selling a product, you need good provenance. To have that provenance, you need solid science. So having a strong scientific link, proving how well the fishery is being managed is vitally important. Cutting links from management tools would be very, very harmful for, for the stock valuation. So anything that retains the, the quality investment in the science of the stock would be welcomed by the processing sector. Sorry, can I just, just clarify what you're effectively saying, that the, the, the fishing sector needs to prove sustainability Absolutely. to be able to market their product. Yeah. Um, Stuart, do you want to come in and, and, and I'll bring Simon back in and then yeah, we'll move it, on to it, the next It thing. was just a tiny point that the overarching framework through ISIS, of course, has existed for over 100 years. So hopefully it survives to other turbulence that's going to happen. But more to the point that our contribution from our scientists continues to be directly connected with ISIS. And I take it that would be the view of everyone. You know, I think we've, we've invested hugely in, in fisheries science over decades. That investment's got to, got to increase and it's got to continue and it's got to be valued. Simon, do you want to come in briefly on that? Yes. Just, a, just a very, very short point. Yes, on backing up Andrew's point, really, industry and science do work together already very closely. Where I'm from in Shetland, there's 
a lot of work going on from everything from marine planning. We're very proud to be part of it, food webs, carbon footprints, and so on. And we, we intend to do that more. One thing, impetus that Brexit does give us, as far as industry and science going, working together is concerned, is a sense that actually something may come of it. And that's actually been the holding back part has not been industry's unwillingness to, co to cooperate with science. It's industry's unwillingness to spend its time funding things that don't get anywhere, which frankly, through the common fisheries policy is what has happened. Once you see there could be a practical outcome in terms of management, you could expect industry to be more enthusiastic still. We absolutely depend on science. Every fisherman will tell you that in his own particular way. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the next theme. John, uh, that's you. Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, Mike Rumble's already asked about the fisheries bill and what might happen at a UK level. So I was just wanting to go a little bit further on that, uh, on the kind of theme of frameworks, which is a word that I think a lot of people understand in different ways, uh, as we found out we were speaking to the agriculture people earlier on. So, I mean, frameworks presumably could be wider than just legislation. It might be a memorandum of understanding or something like that. Uh, but... I was, I was just wondering if you could be a bit more specific about what should be done at a UK level and what should be done at a Scottish level, because I think somebody said sustainability earlier on, was that you, Mr Duncan, which is a very kind of high level thing and everyone signs up to that. But when it comes down to the detail of, you know, net size, number of days at sea, size of the boats, when we, if we're going to expand the fleet, is that going to be a UK responsibility? Is that going to be a Scottish responsibility to take up the 60%? So where does the line draw between what happens at the UK level and what happens at the Scottish level? Um, who'd like to... Um, you're all looking the other way at the moment. Uh, uh, Andrew, do you want to start off? Moving away from the catching sector, what's vitally important is that the processors in the United Kingdom have a level playing field. And a very good start to this would be to remove the destructive business rate values on specific regional areas and have a flat rate, rateable value, throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. That in itself will produce jobs very, very short term and lead to huge reinvestment in the processing industry, particularly in the northeast. That sounded like a plug for your industry, which I, I'm, I'm sure has been noticed. What we're trying to find out is it, the... No, no, that's, that's as a UK. Where it's vitally important as a, as a fishery policy that the uniqueness of fish processing is uh, Across taken, the whole year. And, and it, it becomes this constant. But you I, accept I, that business rates is a devolved matter. And there's no way it's going to be a UK level. Well, it, it is a UK tax. So it's, it's, not, it's devolved by regional valuations but it's a UK tax and if the UK can say right if you're going to if we're going to maximize this massive Brexit potential and you can take a uniform rate throughout the whole of the United Kingdom if you're going to process fish it's going to be done at that level you will immediately get reinvestment back into the processing sector you mean from Scot from England to Scotland particularly in all regions I believe because at the moment we're dying at the present moment, we've had a Brexit in this industry. We've had eight years of growth. The fishing sector is absolutely booming, and the processing sector is dying on its feet. And that's because of the environment that the processing sector is having to work in. If we can sort that and solve that problem, we can then reignite the investment in the industry and not have our valuable fishing asset being trucked outside this country to be processed elsewhere. I mean, because that's the sorry, reality but, just now. I mean, I, th I think we need to get into other areas apart from just rates. But I mean, I would just say that, I mean, everybody would like lower business rates. So um, if, that, if that's what it is. That... Uh, sorry, don't understand that. Sorry, I thought you were meaning business rates. Yeah, yeah. But what do you mean by that? Well, every business would like lower business rates. That's true. And that, but I think that's a separate question. I don't it, really it, think it, that's that where we're That is a separate today. question. What yes. the industry needs is fairness and not a, not a, a tax that is destroying it, and an but, unfair tax that is regionally destroying um, it. Uh, okay. Andrea, I'm, I'm tempted to, to, to part that, have it, having okay. given it quite a bit of air time. Just for clarity. Stuart, for clarity, and, uh, and, and very quickly. Just to, just to be clear, uh, Andrew, your concern is about rateable John, values John, rather than John, to try and get it. the level of the tax, primarily, because I, th I think it's been said that the rateable value per square metre in Hull is about, well, it's le a less than half. 39. It is. Yeah, it's less than half. I am, but it's that serious. Yeah, yeah. I, I am absolutely parking that now. Otherwise, we'll get into the competencies of being a surveyor, which will, will drag me into it. 
having been one. So I want to get away from that and go into frameworks, if I may. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and bring Simon in on that to try and wider it out across, across the UK and, and indeed down to the level in Scotland. So Simon, would you like to lead off on that? Yes, thanks. Thanks again, Kevin. It was, it was, it was really just um, a fairly short commentary. We're told this is work in progress. I guess you know, you've been trying to work on it yourselves, if you could see any of it. Um, there's nothing objectionable in principle on the, the agreed UK-Scottish lines. It's all fairly woolly and you can, there's not much in there to disagree with. As far as the fishing industry is concerned, the catching industry, and presumably the rest of it as well, is what we're interested in is workable outcomes. And that means devolution within the li limits of reasonability. We want the UK to, while we're, the constitutional arrangement seems to work perfectly well at the moment, we'd like that to continue. So you can imagine mesh size and all the other things that were mentioned at the beginning. That should be as rightly devolved power. There's nothing wrong, however. We're saying the devolved administrations do their own bit in terms of day-to-day -day management, but there's no reason before something becomes law for them to sit down and get things as seamless as possible between them. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about practical outcomes, and the practicalities, when it gets to that level, the question is no longer political, which is very helpful. I'm sorry to say that here, but it is. And a practical solution for a, techn a technical matter on fishing Either it works or it doesn't. And that is something which I'm sure could be worked out between DEFRA and Marine Scotland and the other devolved administrations. Because even the EU has changed its view over the years as to what works and what doesn't work, has it not? It, it, it has, and, but the word there is years. Yes. And, and many, many, many years. And not nearly as fast as we'd want. We would rather, from a fishing industry, have the ability to place a phone call to Marine Scotland, discuss it with this parliament, something that could be done quickly, like very quickly. Because sometimes as Callum will bear me out, that the marine ecosystem can change very quickly. You really do need to be fleet of foot about it. So and something like net sizes, you could live with it being different from in Scotland's waters and English waters? Yeah, if that makes sense, absolutely. And I think as long as English and Scots know what they're doing and why, there's no reason why that couldn't happen. These are very, for, for, for many of the fisheries, they are very different fisheries. Okay, there's a boundary, but for many of the fisheries are very different in any case, so it would be appropriate. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring in James Harrison, and then we're, uh, we're going to move on to the next theme. Has changed its view over time, and the, even within a common fisheries policy, there's been a lot of flexibility for member states to adopt higher standards for their vessels when and where they want. Only applicable to their vessels, though. Uh, there's also been derogations uh, that have been allowed from things like minimum landing sizes, where the science backs that up. So I think we wouldn't want to lose that flexibility uh, in a common UK framework, whatever that means. Uh, but I would also add that. The international element of this comes back in even on things like net sizes, uh, gear regulations, because you know, the EU in its negotiating position uh, on shared stocks that was set out at the end of last month was indicating it would be pushing for harmonized fishing regulations, not just agreements on quotas, um, but also going down to the, that more granular level. Uh, and so that those international agreements, and we see this with the coastal state arrangements on mackerel, there are certain minimum standards that everybody agrees to in relation to their own fleet. This will have implications for flexibility as well that will have to be reflected uh, across the UK. Right, I am going to move on to the next theme now, uh, and that will be Richard Lyle. Yes, good morning. Um, basically, sorry, afternoon. Um, we have the London Fisheries Convention, and that convention was signed in 1964. It allows vessels from five European countries to fish within 6 to 12 nautical miles of the UK coastline. In 2017, as you know, the UK government announced that it will withdraw from the London Fisheries Convention. Are you content, is the panel content with the UK withdrawn from the London Fisheries Convention, and what impact do you think that will have on Scotland? James Cook, do, is that something you'd like to head off with to start with, and then I'll bring in other members? Well, I think this is mostly a fish, a white fish related issue. Um, our own, as I say, particular east coast and west coast of Scotland have different, different views on this, um, but I think I would. Okay, Simon, do you want to. Simon, you'll be well, qualified. <laughs> Even more qualified would be, would be Dr. James. Um, in terms of the Fisheries Convention, in terms of practical day-to-day -day stuff, yes, uh, James is right. It's, it's mainly a whitefish issue as far as UK access to other, because it's a reciprocal matter with these other countries. 
but that is, a, is an opportunity which we really won't miss. This is not something that matters greatly now. We have enough quota in our own waters. Even without Brexit, we don't have to go very far to catch it, to say the least. The fish stocks have, re have recovered to that extent. We don't need to go hunting off Skygrek to exercise these rights. So my, legal, or my limited legal understanding was that effectively, perhaps we didn't need to revoke it at all. Perhaps it was rolled into, it was enough to come out of the EU to lose it. And James will know more about that than I. But if it's going good, we won't miss it. Andrew, do you want to come in and then I'll bring in James? We have an opportunity here of a blank canvas and restricting it with ancient deals and regulations. It's time for a fresh start, so I would welcome it. Okay, James Harrison, and then I'll come to Callum. I mean, it's been denounced. The, the denunciation will take effect uh, two years from last July or on Brexit Day, whichever comes later. That was in the denunciation notification. Um, so we will have a clean slate. That doesn't necessarily mean, however, that in the future we might not have new arrangements which allow access, but it will allow us to negotiate those from scratch. So I think it puts us in a, a positive position. Um, Callum, would you like to come in briefly on that one? Yeah, I just wanted to briefly take the opportunity to highlight the importance of, of the insurer and um, the, there's opportunities there, but given... Uh, the commitment to an inshore fisheries bill, which was made a while ago, which I think is urgently needed in Scotland to address the gear conflict we've heard about and to be able to more um, effectively manage our inshore fishing with greater granularity, again with the ecosystem. Um, you know, that's something that we mustn't lose sight of, if I can just take this opportunity to, to flag that up. It's really important. Okay, thank you. Um, the next theme we're going to move on to is led by Peter Chapman. Thank you, Convener. And uh, my, my issue is one of the big issues, I would argue, and that's about trade and tariff and non-tariff barriers. The strange thing about the, the market for fishing in the UK is that we export the majority of what we catch and we import the majority of what we eat which seems a strange thing, but it seems to be backed up by the figures that we, we catch 660,000 tonnes and export nearly 500,000 tonnes of that. And of the fish that we eat, we import 720,000 tonnes, much of that from the European Union. So obviously tariff-free access to the single market for fish products is, is very, very important. So my question is, what are your concerns about possible tariff and non-tariff barriers post-Brexit, and how might any of these problems be overcome? Andrew, would you like to <laughs> head off on that? Tariffs, um, quid, quid pro quo. You know, if, if what's good for the goose, good for the gander, and if, if there is tariffs, one thing about the processing sector is we will deal with those tariffs only if we have a competitive environment to process that product with. Uh, we would love to see no tariffs. I think that would be the best flow of, of, of anything. Uh, but if there are tariffs, we'll deal with it and we'll handle it if we're given the proper environment to do so. Simon, do you want to say something on that? Yeah, I'd like to make a... Um, thanks, Peter, as well. I'd, I'd like to just make a, dis a distinction really between our attitude to tariffs and the non-tariff barriers. We, of course, when the, the Brexit vote came through, the first thing we did really was to scurry over to a WTO rules or and people ploughing through that mass of stuff to figure out what kind of impact it would have or could have. Um, clearly, we'd like, as I guess every sector would like, or most sectors would like, a zero tariffs and frictionless trade. Um, one thing that comforts us in the seafood sector is that it's mutually beneficial to have zero tariffs. We didn't realise until we started looking at this that, in fact, it's pretty much balanced, or was in 1516, the last... <coughs> years which I've got up-to-date information, that because of this phenomenon we've talked about, if we import the fish we eat, we export the fish to other people to eat, it's remarkably similar. It's roughly a billion in each direction every year of seafood. Our stuff is a little bit different. It's often unprocessed rel relatively to process, but nonetheless, you think it's mutually advantageous in seafood, as well as in many other sectors, to have zero tariffs in any case. Um, a couple of our very biggest markets um, are, are relatively insensitive in the sense that, I wouldn't want to be glib about it, mackerel is the biggest single export from Scotland in terms of the catching sector, the biggest single species of the EU as well for that matter. That is already sold largely outside the EU. The next biggest, if you look down the list, and depends which year you look at, nephrops for example, 
they're in a, often in a strong position because in many markets it's very difficult to see what could replace them, and certainly not in that kind of quantity. So there are small things there that give us some comfort, or at least don't plunge, into, plunge us into pessimism. We think this is, in, this is not an insurmountable issue. Um, like Andrew said, you know, we, we can live with it. I think the industry's in a strong place on the catching side. If there are additional costs to absorb, they absorb bigger ones year on year in terms of fuel prices and exchange rates anyway. So that's the tariffs, relatively relaxed, without being complacent, at least not pessimistic. The non-tariff thing is much more serious. It's a serious concern. It's a, press, it's a, it's a, it's a practical concern. Whether, or whether, whether we have a free trade deal or not, if we're outside the customs union, there will be customs, there will be paperwork. We have perishable goods. And that is a short-term issue which needs to be resolved. Again, though, mutually beneficial. There's a lot of perishable stuff coming across from the continent to here as well, obviously, not just seafood. So you would think it's in mutual interest to have something that works as frictionless as possible between ourselves and Europeans if we're outside the customs union. And you'd think in a, in a, in a it's now half a century, I was thinking about half a century since we, or the Americans at least, put a man on the moon, you'd think there'd be enough IT wizards out there to get something that actually works for both sides, because I'm sure there's a commitment, an equal need on both sides to make this work. So there's a short-term concern, yes, but none of that should blind us, of course, to the, to the much bigger price that we see lying out there. Uh, I'm going to bring James Cook in there. Uh, yes, um, I, I think we're very concerned with this. I, I think we were, we were uh, looking at a paper uh, that was supplied by the ESRI, which is the Economic and Social Research Institute of Dublin. Uh, it was a paper uh, in November 2016, and it gave us all the parameters, the different classifications that all fish and processed fish, shellfish, would fall into. And uh, just to summarise it, I think it recommended or it, it suggested that we would see a, a downfall of about 40% of our product through the direct input, you know, if there's no trade, zero trade agreement. And I love this term, frictionless uh, movement. I think that's, uh, that's uh, aspirational, I think, but the reality is it's going to be quite different. Um, so we're very concerned about that. We can supply the, the chamber with the, the paper if anybody would like to follow it. And it gives you a lot of the facts behind the, you know, the World Trade Organization tariffs, which are, are very alarming in the classifications of it. So that's an area that uh, we have to look at. Um, something that might polarize our mind, and I think Anzu in our industry will remember this very well. We had that horrible experience in July 2015 with the migrant crisis in Cali. Now, that just about brought the industry to its knees, and this was only on very infrequent days during that period, where uh, operationally we couldn't get our vehicles and our product to market. Uh, our own company, during that period, I think six weeks, we wrote credit notes for over £200,000 worth of business. And that was just in the six weeks on very infrequent days where we couldn't make market. Uh, and we couldn't actually measure the cancelled business that was actually cancelled. That was just credit notes we had to issue against product that had failed. So Scotland has a lot of high value, especially from our sector, from the Creole sector, very high value premium products, which the European market loves, in particular live langoustine, live lobster, live brown crab. So I think we're very exposed to problems, you know, and we're very, very concerned. Uh, and as I say, I love that term frictionless, but I think that's more aspirational than uh, reality. Okay, I'm, I'm actually going to I'm afraid because time is, is, is marching on. Uh, I'd like to, to bring Jamie in on, on theme seven. Thank you, convener. Uh, good afternoon, panel, and I may uh, apologise for leaving after my own discussion and themes uh, to uh, head to another meeting. But I, I wanted to talk about um, just how we ensure that the fishing interests of Scotland are uh, at the forefront of any Brexit discussions. I mean, the fishing, the fisheries market is accounts for only around 0.05% of Britain's GDP. So in terms of the agricultural scene, it's relatively small. But it's, as you pointed out, Mr. Cook, it's a highly valuable and very important one to Scotland's economy. Uh, how does the panel think that we could ensure that as part of these negotiations, whether it's on trade or tariffs or deals with either the EU or otherwise, that at the forefront of those negotiations is the protection of the industry and how do we ensure that the industry has a loud voice in those? 
who'd like to um, head off on that? Um, I mean, Simon Andrew, uh, James, I mean, one of you, I would have thought, would have strong views on this. Simon. We, 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 thank you, Kavina. The, the answer is we're, we're doing our best. We, we make a lot of noise, I think, collectively for, for a very small industry. I think it's very encouraging also that it's not, at, 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 yes, we make a lot of noise for small industry, but it's not as though nobody cares. We were encouraged when we, in the SFF, we, we, we commissioned an opinion poll in January, and that showed throughout the country, East, West, Remain, Leave, a very, very similar result that 79% of respondents said that the UK should take control of its EEZ and its fishing opportunities on, in 2019 itself. That's, it's, it's an interesting, it's for some reason, it, and it's, that'll go back to history, it's an iconic industry, and people do, for some reason, and it helps us at the moment, take the case of the fishing industry as some kind of iconic importance. This is the one gain that even Remain voters can see right across the board and right across the country, not just in Scotland. So we're encouraged by that, but I don't think, apart from making noise and continue to exercise whatever influence we can, I'm not sure at the end we don't get a seat at the at the negotiation table, and given our size, perhaps we shouldn't. Hey, but I think we're doing what we can. I'm going to bring Callum in and then Andrew. Yeah, very quick one. I mean, as, as MCS and Scottish Environment Link, and as members of Environment Links UK and Greener UK, networks of, of NGOs, we, we're, we're focusing on the principles. Um, so we, we don't necessarily have a, uh, a, you know, a recommendation or a, or a policy preference on this. But I did want to flag to the committee um, a, re a report that was done by the New Economics Foundation that's involved, informed um, uh, some of their thinking, which was not in the same boat. So th there's a range of Brexit scenarios, um, and I'm not an economist. I'm not advocating how uh, how accurate the scenario planning is in there. But the committee, I think, should should show an interest in that report. I can okay, that. Andrew, do you want to come in? What would be helpful, I think, for the industry is putting the value on the stock to, to focus our MPs, MSPs and you, MEPs not to be of what we're actually giving away. And a great way to do that is the, the quota rental to the other European nations, knowing that you've got this lifetime revenue stream. And I think if that happens, that would push it right to the front and we would have... Uh, members of parliament fighting for their life to retain that value and that stock and that tradition. The people of Scotland are very passionate about the fishing industry, but the people in the United Kingdom are very passionate about this industry. It's wild, it feeds us, it's, it's a no-brainer. James Cook and then James Harrison. Well, I think we would like to focus the government's uh, you know, attention that, that this is a it's a fairly small industry but it's very le relevant to Scotland it's a it's a traditional small coastal communities fishery and it's supported you know mixed uh, or varied areas for quite some time and it is now a major contributor I think the figures allow it we've got 1400 member vessels which operate in and around the coast and they would be greatly impacted by this so you know GDP-wise, it's it's not maybe relevant in the in the regards bigger industries, but I think for coastal communities, I think uh, given the, the pressure they've had for quite some number of years, I think it's it's time it got the recognition and the support that it deserved. You know, so Again, any any loss, and if we're talking about 40%, you know, in, in loss of opportunity through a hard Brexit, we have uh, major issues that translates to all coastal communities very very quickly jobs and opportunities. So. I'm going to bring in uh, James Harrison then I'm afraid because of time we're going to have to move on to the next theme. So James Harrison. I mean a very you. quick point is I think I would encourage you to think about this in longer term not just about Brexit negotiations but the UK will be negotiating uh, with coastal states uh, in the you know f in all future years and we need to ensure that the Scottish voice is represented in those negotiations be they bilateral with the EU bilateral with Norway uh, multilateral amongst coastal states or in an organisation such as the North East Atlantic Fisheries Commission. Uh, that there need to be arrangements in place to make sure that uh, the Scottish Government, uh, the Scottish industry and the Scottish Parliament have an oversight of those negotiations to ensure that the uh, Scottish interests are best protected. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid we are going to have to move on and, and the next theme is, is John Finney's theme. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Uh, it's, a, it's a very brief question. It's about the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund and 
information I have here is that between 2014 and 2020, Scotland's been allocated 44% of the, the total UK fund. Um, the, the Scottish Government recently put a, a release out about setting out how 4.8 million of that funding would be um, awarded to 43 projects. So can I ask what the implications for uh, not just sea fisheries aquaculture, but also the process ends be of the loss of that fund and is there an expectation that it would be replaced post-Brexit? Who'd like to head off on that? Um, Andrew, are you happy to start? The loss of that funding would be a, a, a huge setback. Um, I think it's very important, like the farming industry, that's been given a five-year guarantee that funding will remain in place. That same sort of guarantee should be extended to the fishing sector. I would also like to say that that funding should be available without a ceiling because there are many large companies can't gain access to that funding at this present time um, due to uh, rules about uh, turnover etc so I think that that is vitally important if we're going to see this huge investment that I think we need to to in, in processing we've lost over a year of growth 36 percent of our processors if we're going to have this huge uptake in quota, we're going to need huge investment in fish processing, and it's going to need funding, and that type of funding is going to be vitally important to bring those projects forward. Okay. Um, Simon, would you like to...? Yes, yeah, certainly, absolutely agree with that. It's, it's, the actual amounts involved are not always enormous in comparison to the fishing opportunity we have. We did a little study just in, in, in Shetland where we just looked, well, what, what is that actually worth? And it worked out as less than 1%, that's the value of EMFF coming into Shetland, uh, less than 1% of the value of the fish caught by EU vessels within 50 miles of Shetland. So it was, having said, so it's, in that sense, it's relatively unimportant. However, it's absolutely vital for particularly targeted things. It's very difficult to build business cases for infrastructure in rural areas, for example. You really do need that seed, that, that kernel around, around which other structures or other structured finance can be built. That's absolutely essential infrastructure to deal with regulatory change as well. Sometimes that can be very onerous, especially on small vessels, when you get new things coming in. We have a thing called ILO 188, and I won't bother with what, what, what that's all about. It's about standards at, at sea. Some of these things can be very onerous, and there is a need for targeted grant to deal with that. Um, updating our fleet is another, another good one in general. Sustainability, maintaining a reputation of our seafood as well. You think there'd be a need for targeted financing there. It could be very useful and of course in applied science. So while the numbers involved were not, the numbers involved didn't have to be absolutely huge, we would expect that to be replaced for all those reasons because it, even a small amount properly targeted could make a very, very big difference in some of the communities we're talking about. Uh, James, do you want to come in on that? Huh? Yes, and uh, to underline that, I think it's very relevant that we get some sort of framework in place that, uh, similar to the farming community, that we'd guarantee us um, access to, to funding so that investment can follow what we hope is going to be a very profitable catch sector and opportunities abound. And it would be rather ironic that all these opportunities were presented and there was no funding in place for anybody to access it. So, again, we'd be very supportive of that. John, do you want to follow that up at all? I think perhaps Simon had something further to add. Uh, yes. yes. Thanks, Camille. Just very quickly, John, just one point I would mention as well, which comes into frameworks and everything else. Under the EMFF, there's a pot of money which comes to the UK and then is divvied out among the developed administrations. It's a very clumsy arrangement or maybe no arrangement. It's very unsatisfactory sometimes when there is a need in Scotland, for example, and we can't tap into an English pot, you can't transfer stuff across. If we're to replicate an EMFF-style system, in the UK, it's important that untapped resources can be used by other devolved administrations. There should be some mechanism to allow that. Um, okay. Callum, very briefly. Yeah. Whatever sort of funding arrangements are in place, we, the public money should be used for public good, so th it should incentivise uh, sustainable fishing and uh, a race to the top. That's what we'd like to see in terms of um, encouraging sustainable fishing practice. And it's an opportunity to also look at novel ways of funding. Um, other industries help, um, help fund mar marketing and data collection and strategic environment assessment and so on. So maybe the government should explore a um, cost recovery system, maybe with a um, small levy on industry as well, to help that industry in the long term because it helps to fund monitoring data collection and so on that can help inform a more sustainable fishery. 
Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, and it gives me the chance to ask one question at the end. Um, and I'm going to put a limit on it in the sense that I'm going to ask you to give one thing that you haven't mentioned already that you think the Scottish Government or the UK Government should be concentrating on um, and, and should be doing at the moment. So one thing you haven't mentioned before um, and that either the UK or the Scottish Government should be doing that they're not, they're not doing or not doing enough of. So I'm going to start on the right and work to the left. That's my right, your left. So Simon, that's you and I'll work down the table. Um, I, I would like to, make, like to make a plea. It's, it's, it's a general want, and that is of Scottish Government that we're all aware of the Scottish Government's position with regards to Brexit, that nonetheless there is a need to get practical things done in preparation for Brexit. And some of, this, some of the um, fisheries management issues that should be looking to the future, what can we do differently? I think there needs to be more, more zeal, if not about Brexit, but about the opportunities and the work that could be done now to prepare for that. That would be a plea, really. Thank you. Um, James Cook. Um, well, the one area that we haven't really touched on is uh, the customs situation, uh, you know, at the Channel ports. Uh, that's something that I think is very relevant. We've, we've not really had any consultation at all with anybody regards custom, customs documentation, clearance, or even any clear principle on how this is going to happen or work. Um, I know that um, it's in its infancy, but it's a very relevant problem for us going forward. Uh, currently, we enjoy CMR documentation to access Europe because of the freedom of the nature. So, uh, dedicated customs, uh, sorry, CMR documentation. Was is a, just that a, was a TLA, which I didn't quite pick up on. Uh, Three CM, letter CMR, oh. I think it's just a, a customs document that allows okay. us access uh, to export our goods into the EU, um, so, and it's a very, as I say, frictionless operation at the moment. But we would certainly like uh, some focus put on this issue and some consultation with our industry about preparing customs documents customs. that are relevant for our industry. Yeah. Thank you, James. Uh, Callum? I would like to see more collaborative working across the UK administration, similar, again, to what I said a year ago. Um, we know that the officials are doing what are termed by them deep dives <laughs> in terms of exploring policy detail to then inform ministers. So it, it would be about uh, uh, you know, communicating more about these issues um, and feeding back from those, uh, the, the, those meetings of officials to relevant, rele their relevant ministers and to the relevant parliaments and, and wider stakeholders as to actually where discussions are at, because yeah. there needs to be collaboration. Andrew, I'd, I'm sure I don't need to say nothing you've mentioned before, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see every species in our sea given very good provenance and supported by solid scientific data and, and research. That's what I would like to see. I, you know, we have the cod, the haddock, the uh, mackerel, the coley, all with very good provenance. But I would like to see investment in all species because we've got wonderful species out there that don't have the backing of the science. And with that investment, then we can absolutely maximize this Brexit opportunity and get the most out of uh, the extra 60%. Hopefully the United Kingdom will process over the next 30, 40 years as we slide to catching all our own fish mm -hmm. and not uh, having foreign people catch our fish and enjoy the benefit of it. James Harrison. I would like to say that I think fisheries management and policy can't be dealt with as an isolated issue. Um, we have uh, a really good marine spatial planning system in the UK and in Scotland particularly for inshore waters and fisheries needs to be dealt with in that context and plugged into the marine planning system. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. We have slightly overshot our time. Uh, Again, it's rather like the last panel. I think it's a very interesting subject and it's been very worthwhile for the committee. So I'd like to thank uh, all the witnesses and I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting. I would ask members to stay in their seats and I'd ask the witnesses to, to leave, leave as quickly as possible so we can finish the last item on our agenda. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. I'd like to reconvene the meeting and move to the agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation. This item is the consideration of one negative instrument concerning the import inspection fees for plant health. No motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? Agreed. It is agreed. Thank you. That concludes today's meeting, and I now close, which I now close. Thank you. <laughs>